Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollack's chat show. Shockingly, I am still chat show. So nice of you to join us today. It is um, 79 degrees here in uh, Culver City, where we come to you live at this very moment. Uh, so my heart immediately goes out to the rest of the world where the weather may not be so fantastic. And the people that are affected by the recent tornadoes and whatnot are uh, love and strength to each and every damn one of you. I was just in the New York. I don't know if you've been. A lot of people go to the old York for holidays. I was in the New York, and um, still a lot of Jews. Just going to put that out there. Uh, I had a great time at Caroline's on Broadway. It was a lot of fun. I did some uh, press, and um, I want to thank everyone at, the, at Opening and Anthony. Opening and Anthony. Mm -hmm. That is their legal name. Yeah, that is their legal name. The fans call them O and A, o &A. or Opening. I did it again. You did it. That's, you're stuck. You read too many contracts. I want to just say it as one word. Yeah. That's my opening. Maybe I should write them uh, <laughs> Maybe you should. the email. Opie and Anthony. You're on to Unbelievably. And, and ironically, or not, Anthony not there. Wasn't there. Yeah. It's me and the Jim Norton and um, my new favorite person, actually, in the world, uh, Ron Bennington from the Ron and Fez. Yeah. Ron was sitting in and... Uh, I gotta give J Mac credit on this show because I forgot twice to give him credit on while I was on O and A. Oh, uh, for turning me on to all this uh, hilarity, and uh, went on Thursday on the O and A. Had a blast in the morning. Jim Norton was there, and the res rest of the regular crew, the Sam, the whatnots, and uh, uh, Opie was feeling alone and said, "You gotta come back tomorrow." So I did two days on that show. That was great fun, and their fans are insane. But help me to launch a new uh, comedy podcast. Yeah, this wasn't enough. Sorry. Sorry, interwebs. I need more. So uh, those of you who do not know, and you're in the billions, uh, there's something now called Talk and Walkin'. Uh, we're going to throw it up on the screen there, those of you watching as opposed to listening. Here's the website, you're talkandwalkin.com. Talkin' and walkin', by the way, spelled with I-N, I-N, so that there's no lawsuit, no lawsuit. He, Walken himself, loves it, I, I, I've been told by the man himself. But, you know, he's got a family, and they may want, want money. They may come after me at some point. I think they're going to come after you for a, a different thing. What's the other reason, Sammy? I, I, they may literally come after you. Oh, I see. Yeah. Not fans. No. <laughs> you, uh, how dare you? Right. You've spoken to some of them. How dare you, first, sir? <laughs> and, then they will, and then he will come. All right. That's how it works. That's how it worked, for sure. Uh, but Talking Walken was launched... Um, a week ago today, and after five days on the iTunes, uh, we cracked the top ten of comedy podcasts, which blew my shit away. So thank each and every damn one of you. I just announced it on Twitter um, to the quarter million of you followers. More than Hitler now. But I've decided to leave Poland alone. You can have it. I thought you said Paul Lind. That's what I thought. What? Really? What about, what about, what I'm not going to leave Paul Lind, Lind, Lind alone. alone. <laughs> no, I'm not going to leave Paul Lind no. alone. Poland, I'm leaving alone. Because it's cool. It's cold most of the time. Uh, I don't imagine Hitler would have been a big Paul Lind fan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so, yeah, talkandwalkin.com. If you would go to uh, the site itself, if you don't want to do the iTunes, it's a clickable link, the RSS feed, blah, blah, blah. Check it out, the artwork there by Jeremy R. Scott. Love him. He did our chat show. There you can see. Um, write to me at contact, believe it or not, contact at talkandwalkin.com or funny words at talkandwalkin.com, and if you listen to an episode, you know what the hell that means. Uh, Matt Myra was kind enough to help me launch the damn thing. Sammy's going to come on board. I've already, um, it's just me as Christopher Walken for an hour talking to a friend about nothing. Right. And uh, it's the conversational impressions that I always love. If you can get the impression to a pl place where it's, he's talking about the cat pooed, so I had to clean that up, which is fun, because there's bags and a scoop. There's a scooper. I feel bad for people with dogs. They follow them with a bag on their hand. Say, go, go, Fido, because that's still a name for a dog. Go, Fido. And they wait, and then they... Anyway, so it's an hour of that. So how could you not want to... You know what I'm saying? Do you feel it? You're not buffering. You're not buffering. I just needed to go to the Bahamas for a moment. I wanted to uh, thank also everyone at the Carolines, I think I mentioned. We did a only the second Talk and Walkin' uh, live on stage at Carolines with uh, Mad Men's Rich Summer. 
Rich Summer, fabulous, uh, funny man and, and wonderful actor, and also Rory Albanese, who's a very funny stand-up, who was working with me that weekend at, at Caroline's, also happens to be the seven-time Emmy Award-winning executive producer of The Daily Show, that Rory Albanese. That Rory And personal Albanese. friend of Sam Levine, who hmm. said he'll see you in Kansas City. Yeah, he will. Um, also, congrats to our dear friend and former guest of the show, Robert Legato, picked up another fucking Oscar. Academy Award winner, Robert Academy Legato. Academy Award winner, multiple. He's got another one. Unbelievable. For the Hugo. That movie was magical. Visual effects. That movie I liked, I enjoyed is it. magical. And also congratulations to Uggy uh, for another Uggie. fantastic showing at the Oscars. Is that the dog? That's the, the dog. dog's name is Uggy. He was on stage when they won uh, the Best Picture. He looked very Love that nice dog. in his black tie and his little golden bone yeah. collar. Yeah. I so thought cute. the act, he did. The actor who won Best Actor from the Jean Artist? Jean Desjardins. His name again? Jean Desjardins. Right. Also my favorite dish. Uh, he blew an amazing opportunity. Should have gone up and accepted the award as a silent film and not a talkie. Should have gone up and pantomimed his award. Then on a big screen behind him, they put the words, come on! Well, the problem with that is the that Rehearsal? Would be, yeah. And also people going, how do I know he's going to win? How do know he's going to win? You know, I think he should have just done it completely in French. Well, my, yeah, because my thing was, you can't understand a fucking word he's saying anyway, so yeah. why not go for the gag? Uh, Sammy, you've been busy. Oh, one last thing in New York. Sorry, I can't believe I buried the lead. Shatner's World. It's traveling around the world. I saw the uh, one-man show on Broadway. This is ridiculous. Um, our own Sammy Levine's brother uh, and father, Max and Harris, came to my uh, show at Caroline's. And then when they were saying their uh, nice job afterwards, they mentioned that they had just gone to see Shatner's World, one man show on Broadway at the Music Box Theater, where he's doing a three week run. And I thought, fuck, how can I not go to this? Right? So Rich Summer was all set to do the talk and walking with me. And I said, let's go have lunch or brunch, as they do beforehand. And then, do you want to go to the matinee, the three o'clock of Shatner's World? He says, yes. I uh, email Shatner's office, and one of his 19 assistants gets back to me and says, tickets are all set. Super excited, can't wait. Rich Summer and I are at brunch at Bobby Flay's Mesa Grill. Of course, two nights before, uh, my guest and his uh, cast uh, went to Bobby Flay's Bar American. It was a big Bobby Flay's week. <laughs> I can't get enough. It's you still really a man can. crush after all these years. Um, well, the food is great. You know, if his food stunk, I would. All right. So, while Rich Summer and I were at brunch, my phone, uh, as they said four years ago, was blowing up. And uh, I still say that. Do you? Yeah. That's because you're old Sam. You betcha. So I don't recognize the numbers. And then uh, I said, well, you know, too, much, too many phone calls in one brunch. I better, sorry, Rich, check this out. Sure enough, one of them is, is um, from Shatner. Uh-oh. Yeah, maybe I should play it. Do we? No, no, we don't have time. <laughs> but it's basically uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, it's Bill. Uh, listen, uh, so, so you'll come back to the stage uh, uh, before the show, about a half hour, and we'll, we'll discuss what the bit is we're going to do. Huh, what? So I call back. Uh, Kevin, I'm so excited. All right, so we'll see you soon. You'll be here soon? Yes, I will, Bill, and I'm very excited about the, this bit we're going to do, but uh, unfortunately I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, they didn't tell you. I, I'm so sorry. Uh, you'll come backstage. We'll discuss it. So Rich and I go backstage where Shatner's putting on makeup for this one-man show in his dressing room there at the music box. And he says, uh, Kevin, listen, uh, so, so it's about a little under two-hour show. And uh, 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 at the end, uh, you, I'll, I'll take my bow. Uh, three minutes before the ending, uh, someone will tap you in your seat. You'll come backstage. You'll stand on the wings. And then I'll, I'll take my bow. Uh, uh, hopefully, they'll be applauding. Uh, and then at the end of it, I'll, I'll quiet them down. And I'll say, oh, and this is what happened. Exactly that. They tap me, I'm waiting in the wings, and then he says, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad you like the show. I have a great treat for you. Uh, an old friend, a wonderful actor, uh, and comedian, Kevin Pelton. And I come out thunderous applause with the half John Wayne, half Shatner swagger, right? But I was so blown away, taken in, inspired by the show, I'm now going on and on about how much I love the show. and, he, and I can't help it, because it really was, I mean, I'm as biased as it gets, but it really was ridiculously great. So now I'm going on and on, and he, his only response is, uh, thank you. I thought we were going to do a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no one can take a compliment, especially a Jew. So I said, uh, 
Oh, he's right. Ladies and gentlemen, I've made an entire career from pausing. And I held it longer than I should have. And the crowd, I, I got my big laugh, my big applause, and Shatner literally said, that's enough. Thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> he walked off stage. Because he didn't know if I was going to get another laugh. So like, he, he was smart. He said, let's go out on the laugh. Go out on the hunt. It was fucking surreal, needless to say. Sammy? Yeah, buddy. Enough about me. Let's talk about you. How do you feel about me? You did... Uh, this last week working on the Christian Slater show Breaking In. Yes. With Tell the, us about that, please. With, the, with Christian Slater and Megan Mullally. She's a regular and, on the uh, show? She sure is in this new season. It, yeah. yeah. Holy shit, fantastic. Very, very funny show, very funny people, exciting. I don't know when it's going to air, nah. but it's going to shatter people's minds when it does. Jamie knows when it's going to air. Well, no, I mean my episode. I believe it airs Tuesday nights on Fox. After the new girl, is that right? After the new girl. But I don't know when my episode will air, but you should watch them all. Jamie, why do you seem upset? You seem upset. I'm not upset. Elaine just uh, asked me something about Dr. Beth randomly, and now my mind's there. Like, she's asking me, like, where are the cat practices? I'm like, not now. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm glad you pointed it out, because it's important That's that Elaine Ewing... That's I spaced a little bit. Sorry. Elaine Ewing, our, our media, social media expert and producer, is uh, in the chat room asking questions about Dr. Beth from the cat practice. <laughs> yes. Uh, is, is Alvin the Alvinator having difficulties? No, I think she's just saying that she likes that strip mall that it's in. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for that. Elaine. Yeah. I'm sure the people in um, Venezuela that are watching the show right now are loving the hell out of it. Huge Venezuela following. Gigantic. I was, I was really blown away by the numbers in Venezuela. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to get Mr. Christian Slater on this program. You've made that happen? Uh, yes, he has Did committed. You... It's just a matter of figuring out the dates now. Did you wrestle in Megan Mullally to... Discuss her lovely time Didn't have here. to. He was sold. He's, he's a big fan of uh, Jamie's, uh -huh. as it turns out. <laughs> he and I did a motion picture together. One of the all-time great 3,000 Miles to Graceland? No, that one too. Would that be? Yes, that one. That one too? No, that one. Just the one. Just the one. Yeah. <laughs> it's not good. No. He was terrific in it. Uh, hey, did you know we're on Hulu.com now? Did you know that, Sammy? I did. Yep. The Someone whole library keeps telling me. in all new shows. A new show drops every Tuesday on Hulu.com. Please write to us and tell us about your experience watching the show on Hulu.com. We'd love to hear from you. Contact the Kevin Pollock's chat show.com. You uh, didn't even ask me about me and Kenny going to Disneyland for 24 It's hours. right here. Where are you? Oh, Now's the time. skipping over it, going to the Hulu. Well, Elaine threw me off a little. You're right. I need, uh, they have a, a, is this the, how many annuals? Second annual, third annual? What? All, is this the first one, all night? This is the first one that I'm aware of. Do you, Kenny, it was, do you know? I don't think they've ever done it before. Okay, leap year, tell us. So on leap day, sure. on leap year, Disneyland is open from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. And we, Kenny and I went. And it was... No shout out to Cherry? Sure. And well, I went with, well, Kenny, people who watch the show know Kenny. If I said my friend Cherry, and nobody in the chat room is going to know who that is. But they're going to know Dr. Beth and the cats? <laughs> I won! That's a lame <laughs> So Sorry. Uh, we went and come around like what? What would you say, Kenny? Like midnight? It got it reached capacity? Oh, yes. It reached capacity. The park reached capacity at about midnight, and it was so packed from like midnight to like I I couldn't take it after like three thirty in the morning. I like I just left. You tapped out at three thirty. I tapped out because you couldn't do anything. Everything was at, like, at least a two hour wait. Uh, it, it's like if you wanted a churro, the the lines were like forty people deep. It was insane. It 40 was people three o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. Forty people for a churro. Yes. Kenny almost had to fight a guy because I wanted popcorn, and apparently I got in front of this guy. I wasn't quite aware of what was going on because I was really drunk. So, but uh, sorry, it sounded like you <laughs> said you were really drunk. Maybe I had a couple cocktails. It's the happiest place on earth, Kevin. Oh, my <laughs> bad, my bad. I, some people. There's a lot of day drinking going on and night drinking, apparently. <laughs> I have a mysterious bruise on my knee that is about the size of a softball. Don't know where that came from. Oh, yeah, you do. You fell we, down. Uh, I didn't remember writing It's a Small World until I saw photos of it the next day. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nothing like blackout drunk at Disneyland. Nothing. <laughs> I had a great time. Nothing. I had a great time. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, that's, did you? I think that's going to be the next Hangover movie, actually. As it's been retold, I had a great time. Uh, well, I, so we want to hear from next year as well. Make your plans now. Sec it's every four years. Second annual. Duh. That's why it's not funny. Yeah, it's All right. not. I don't understand what you're saying. Um, thank you for that. It's now time to uh, hear from our, our wonderful viewers. They, we ask you to write in at contact com. This one is this category of uh, questions from you is uh, under the Ask Kevin. So we had some Ask Kevin. graphic with the teeth. This one from Vincent Torrey. Hey, 
I was watching The Departed on a basic cable channel, and I thought the cleaned-up version of Jack sounded a lot like you. Do you do that sort of thing? Um, no. That was uh, somebody else, or Jack. I am the voice, however, uh, of um, Dwight D. Eisenhower in Philip Kaufman's The Right Stuff. They got an actor that looked exactly like him. I was in San Francisco doing the stand-up comedy at the time. And they brought me in to say this. The first American in space is not going to be a chimpanzee. He sounded close enough to Clark Gable that I could pull it off. First American in space. Yeah, that would have been a little more. I think more. What, what Vincent Torrey is, is asking that. Did I loop Nicholson? Would you, would you loop the cable version, <laughs> the TV-safe version of a, a famous, per, you know, a celebrity that you would do an impression of? Yeah, and uh, I haven't. I haven't. So, Dave for, instance, for instance, I do an uncanny Bruce Willis. And we know that because? Uh, because at the end of uh, Die Hard 2, I see. Uh, right before he lights the plane on fire, it's actually me. Who, you, it, Bruce says, yippee ki but then I come in and say, Mr. Falcon. <laughs> so I didn't know that was now you. you know. I didn't know that was you. Yeah, that's me. Well, see, that kind of insight you can only get here. Yeah. Uh, I do know that I believe Dave Couillet uh, did a little uh, Richard Pryor. Oh. I think he told us a little bit. Look, look, go back through the archives and look up the Dave Couillé interview. It was pretty good anyways. Well, there's your answer to that. Uh, how do I do KPCS is another category that I don't believe we have artwork for. This is from Christopher Tripp. Hi, Kevin. I am Christopher Tripp from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and now reside and work remotely out of Costa Rica. What? Enjoying the pure life. As a web developer, I watch your show while working from the mountainside in the jungle overlooking the great surf of the Pacific Ocean with my girl and my dog. I watched Ignatian for years and was especially comforted while spending a couple of years in Dubai and Iraq working on a contract from the government. We're halfway through this. I, of course, saw you on their finale. Oh, the Dignation. Uh, and coincidentally, again, later that day while finding my new favorite channel, This Weekend. Thisweekend.com. As I watched, I noticed Sam Levine from Glorious Bastards because it was just on a few nights before that, and I happened to rent... Uh, and I happen to rent one of his castmates and writer Michael Bacall's villa here in Costa Rica. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Small world. Anyhow, keep filming so I can keep watching. I do appreciate it. Pura Vida, Chris. Oh, that's the next one. Oh, that's uh, from Costa Rica. So there you go. All right, now it's time for the Larry King game to help our guest get a better understanding of how the Larry King game works. If you want to win a T-shirt, Kevin Pollock Show T-shirt, you just have to write in Larry King game and have me read it live on the show, and then you will win yourself a t-shirt. The rules again, bad Larry King impression. That's rule number one. I want a bad one. I don't want a good one. Then I want to see Larry go to a, a little uh, momentary lapse of time and space and share something about himself that we really didn't need to know. It's a too much information moment. TMI? No. Too yeah, much? Yeah, TMI. Yeah, TMI. That's TMI, Larry King. And then go to the phone's name of the city. is funny sounding. It's helpful. Here's this week's winner, Jason Griswold, who as Larry King writes, reminds me of back in August of 1966. I was at poolside at the Fountain Blue with Elkie's summer. We had just rubbed an entire bottle of baby oil on each other's loins when she grabbed a pen and said to me, Lawrence, she said, when I connect, uh, connect all the liver spots on your back, it looks like Jack Klugman. Salomenka, New York for Hal Linden. Hello. That's all it takes to win a t-shirt from this damn show. Congratulations to this week's winner. Uh, size large, I believe. I know you were wondering about that, Sammy. I was. Um, check out uh, the T-shirts, the travel mugs, everything else available to you on the uh, on the merch page on the KevinPollockChatShow.com and get yourself a little something you can show your friends you listen to the damn thing. Um, I uh, It was through my uh, life and workings in the interwebs that I first um, started hearing more and more about my guest today because of a uh, interwebs show that he... Uh, stars in and writes and whatnot, uh, directs and produces and everything. And uh, I was basically forced to sit down and watch it at gunpoint. And uh, I immediately uh, thanked my captors because it was so ridiculous, fun, funny, and uh, silly. And as he's been called, uh, he specializes in absurdist humor, which I thought was an interesting take on it because it was kind of perfect. Um, and uh, have since become uh, friendly beyond the fanship uh, with this wonderful filmmaker. And um, quite a presence as we do the research, as J-Mac uh, puts together the 53-page, in this case, dossier before today's uh, chat in preparation. Um, 
We've had a couple of his friends here, starting with uh, Thomas Lennon, I believe, and then uh, quite recently, Joe Latrulio, if I learned how to say his name correctly. You got it. You got it. Um, but thrilled beyond belief. The hell with those two. Please say hello to David Wayne. David! I am thrilled. Let me just say... I'm just so happy to be activated. Well... Having been sitting here... <laughs> for 72 listening, minutes? I had many things that, that came to mind I would have tossed in, but mm. I wanted to let you have your space, <laughs> do your thing, have the features, the characters... Right? The graphics. The it was, cast. I enjoyed it. I'm no. a fan. I am a fan of the show. Stop it. I've seen it uh, sporadically, parts of it over time. Uh huh. Uh, We're best consumed sporadically. Long time fan of all of the things you do, but let's not talk about you, <laughs> please. And very flattered to be here. Oh, uh, well, thrilled. In the seat that many great people have sat. Well, listen, Eddie Izzard sat there for two hours and thirty-two minutes. Um, that would be an example. We uh, we came here, I believe, and did a show just after the premiere, shortly after the premiere of Wanderlust, and I would not shut up about it. I was kind of raving and, and a bit like a lunatic. Now your tune has changed. Well, no. <laughs> it's only gotten stronger because it's, it's had more time to resonate, and the truth of the matter is, and I've said this to you, but I need to say it in front of you, um, it's such a hard thing to do in comedy, to be wildly silly and believably um, interesting as a story. Thank you. As a storyteller, it's one of the hardest things, I think, in the world to pull off because the silly we've seen done magically, the Mel Brooks and the what have yous over the years. And I felt like there were times where Woody Allen was able to deliver the silly and the real. Yeah, Albert way. Brooks, certainly. Louis C.K., I think, on his show goes from silly to poignant to uncomfortable. More than anyone. And funny um, and powerfully. But in a movie as silly and funny as Wanderlust, uh, I was really surprised and taken by... My, I found myself really caring about uh, our two leads. That's and, awesome. And the romantic difficulties therein. Specifically, the love story. Your audience needs to know this movie, Wanderlust, is a current movie in theaters it, now. Right now. That's what. That's it. Yeah, they no, we... That, and they need to tell ten of their friends to go see it with them. Do what you want. It's a great film. Take great ten film. films. Let us say what a great film it is. No, because, is. honestly... The studio's only going to get so much behind a film that they almost understand, <laughs> specifically the marketing department. Yes. I'm sure, and I want to hear more about how the executives you worked with uh, understood the comedy, um, because you and Ken Marino wrote the script together. That's right. And, you know, it went through machinations, one has to assume, <laughs> but uh, I want to hear a lot about the sort of give and take, because... You've had experiences on, a, on an independent level where you mm -hmm. started at NYU, and then big studio stuff like Role Models. Yeah. This one, I felt like the movie was way better for your value of dollar than the marketing department got behind. Well, So frustrations aside, yeah. what, what was it like as a filmmaker? That aspect of it? I mean, you know, I think this studio, it was challenging to market, and they, were, they admitted it uh, all along. It was not something that they exactly knew the way in because is it a, a as you said is it an absurd you know culty david wayne kind of guys from the state kind of comedy or is it a romantic comedy with big movie stars jennifer aniston you know and or is it somehow both or neither and so i think uh, that might have uh, been challenging for them yeah because there's no one in marketing in a studio that can say those are the challenges you know what Let's gear the campaign towards that. Let's lean into the problems and actually promote it by saying, is this a silly comedy? Show some silly comedy scenes. Or is this a romantic comedy? You be the judge. I will say, and this is not me being diplomatic, the marketing people at, at Universal really did have those discussions. Great. And they really thought about it in that way. And they really wanted to honor the spirit of what the film really is. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I mean, I'm not a marketing person at all. And I, I had no idea how to then turn that into a campaign, and I think that was where the challenges were. Like, right. And I, I, it's not like I was like, this is how it should be done, and no one listened to me, because I didn't know either. Well, I, I could <laughs> sense, though, uh, from the research that you are, um, and as I've always sort of uh, attempted to be, true to your nature of what interests you and what makes you laugh. And, yes, for and, better or for worse. Well, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to answer to that. Yeah. So I sleep well knowing that I've yeah. stuck to my voice, stuck to what I think is funny, what I care about, what right. means something to me comedically. And, you know, comedy is, is I take it seriously. 
<laughs> right, which you should, you should. It's serious stuff. Uh, Consequently, yeah. how much about marketing could you possibly know? Because that's not... It's just not my area. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I mean, you know, people had a lot of... There was varying feelings about our trailer. Some people thought it was great. Some people thought it was terrible. Another thing that I just don't know. I don't... It's, it's so... I'm, I'm really... have a lot of experience over many years putting together a scene, a sequence, a movie, a, an episode, a trailer. I don't know. Really? A commercial. I don't know. The trailer has escaped you. I just, it's hard for me to know what the best, although now that I, I had an idea for a trailer two weeks after the movie came out, you way too late, bitch. which is to play, if, you, if anyone has seen the film, the first scene in whole, which is the, just Jennifer Aniston and Paul Rudd talking to a real estate developer, right. played by, uh, broker played by Linda Lavin, Wonderful. and then it just ends and goes in the credits. That in alone would be like maybe a good intro to say, and then off this movie goes, right. maybe then a few clips and then you're out. Yeah. Well, next time. Well, next time, maybe. I mean, clearly there's a science. Mm. And not an easy job to rise up through the ranks in marketing at this point because so much of the movie business is driven by that, and TV for that matter. Well, you know, there's so many millions of dollars being spent to make feature films. that They have to find ways to turn it into science, even though there is no science, because right. it's reinventing the wheel every time. So they have the test screenings, and they look at the scores, and they do surveys, and they do market research, and they look at numbers, and they try to turn that into oh, that means it's worth spending this dollar amount to do this, but no one ever knows. Do you have an absurdist moment from any of the testing? Um, the, the example that always comes to mind for me is Barry Levinson. When I worked with him on Avalon, he had just come from doing and winning awards for Rain Man. Yes. And he met with the people who were going to finance the studio that was going to finance Avalon, and he said, here's the reason I'd rather you not test Avalon and do the test screenings. And he gave him a three-by-five card from the, a test screening of Rain Man on which a audience member had written, hey, why didn't the little guy just snap out of it? That was the person's response. My favorite part, hey, comma. Right. Way, yeah. the, um, the, the amount of power that we give people who wander, who have the time to wander in and see some free movie that they've never heard of, yeah. and then write some things down on a card is enormous. If yeah. they had any idea how much you know, money and reshoots and are, are determined by, it's crazy. Yeah. In our movie, we had uh, test screenings, and you know this happens every time. They write down, they say the most hated scenes by the entire audience were one, two, and three, mm -hmm. and the favorite scenes were one, two, and three, the same scenes. It's always this, the the, really? the memorable scenes are the ones that half the audience says is my least favorite, and half them says my favorite. And so you're like, okay, what do we do with that? Yeah, <laughs> throw them out. Yeah, or and then and then or do you go like in our movie? There's a, a fair amount of nudity, and that was another thing where people were like, I love how much nudity there was. And other people were like, it's way too much nudity. I would have liked the movie if not for the nudity. So then what do we do? Go halfway? Yeah. Just go for it? You know, s s s say goodbye to those people? How it's difficult are those decisions and how much of a line in the sand is the studio drawing? It's really hard because, they, like I said, there's multiple ways to interpret the cards and the, the scores and the numbers. So ultimately, the studio will chime in and say, look, well, from what we see on the test, we definitely feel strongly about this. Right. And I'll say, well, I think this, or maybe we agree on something. And then, and then as a filmmaker, hopefully, all of these things are just a tool, an indicator, a helper to then just make your own decision from your gut. But yeah. that's only in theory sometimes because you're not always the only one voting. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's spring back in time to you and Ken Marino decide you're going to write this uh, movie yeah. together. Um, I had heard from you in conversation, or maybe it was Ken, that you guys like to lock yourself in a room and then whatever you have at the end of this period of time. But then through the research, it seems like that might have been done where you're both locked in separate rooms and over Skype. Or is the initial getting together? The initial getting together, we've done this twice. Okay. The initial getting together is in person because we live in separate coasts. Yeah. I live in New York City. I mean, you were just talking about it earlier. Yeah. And by the way, I just want to make sure and confirm that we are not letting go of Paul Lind. No. That's important to me. We're not. Because this guy, it's time for him to get his due. I know he's long dead, but it's time that we skewer this Wait, dude. Paul Lind is dead? I'm sorry. Well, he lives on in the character of Roger on American Dad. Uh... And he's here with us right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're not the only one. Do the point. Wait a minute, at uh, Sketchfest, wasn't everyone, no, where was it that everyone was doing? Yeah, that th thrilling adventure, adventure hour. It was yeah. thrilling adventure. Yeah. They wrote in, we were doing Oscar Wilde, but everybody did a Paul Lynn Paul impression. Lynn. Paul Lynn. Thank you. That was yeah. funny. <laughs> oh, boy. What, what were we talking about? 
<laughs> you and Ken Moreno in separate rooms. But we get into together. separate rooms. We, no, we get it. We get together in the same room. So I fly to to L.A. and we go to and sit in his bedroom for a week straight, seven days, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We have no idea in our heads. The first thing we do is come up with an idea. By the end of day one, we have an idea and an outline. By the end of day two, we've worked, done another pass on the outline. Day three, four, five, six, seven, we write the script. And by the end of seven days, we have a first draft of a screenplay that's probably terrible, but it's something. And now we can start, and then from then on, we work on it over Skype, when we can, in between other things. Right. We have kids, it's, it's busy. Yeah. But we, wrote, we write and have written most of what, what we've done over Skype. Right. Um, so that first week together in Ken's bedroom. Yes, living room. Liv oh, is it living room? In the Hollywood Hills. Ah. I'm trying to paint a picture. What's the address? <laughs> <laughs> um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So 34th Smith Court. <laughs> I had to tell you. You did. <laughs> Smith Court, thanks for the effort. Um, you're typing, I understand, because you're just faster on the keyboard. I know how to type, and he does not. Let's yeah, put it that way. Because he hated that class at school. Right. But otherwise, is there a lot of moving around? Is there a, you yes, know, it's the a process classic, is always fascinating. Neither of us smoke, so it doesn't have that classic element to it. Good. But otherwise, we're pacing around. We're frustrated. We're going back and forth. We're doing voices back and forth. Like, what? How would you? Uh, you know, we take a stop, take a walk, think about it, come back. Now, I've heard you say that uh, he has a great organic sense of the visual. That's right. For comedy. Ooh. So what did you mean by that? That's very fascinating. Ever since I met him, when we were 18 years old and we were doing The State, mm -hmm. his writing and his ideas often took on a visual element. Like he'd have an idea for something that's the joke is in how something is staged or in how the, where the camera is. Or he's always just had a really strong creative visual instinct. And I've always admired that in him. And I've tried to develop my own you know, alongside that. But he, that's, that's one of his great strengths. You um, started your creative uh, writing in terms of sketch work. Mm. Um, and we've heard from a couple of others about the new group and uh, yes. sketch at NYU. Let's start before that. I'm curious when the first sort of notion was uh, that you might have that in you. You grew up in the Shaker Heights of the Ohio. I grew up in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Uh -huh. Suburb, beautiful. I had three much older sisters, uh -huh. a mom and a dad. My dad was a, is a bit of a ham. He was in the radio business. He was an on-air announcer okay. for many years. Right. Uh, he was not in the ham radio business. He was not in the ham radio business. And ham, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sam finds his moment. <laughs> right there. Sam rhymes with ham, especially. <laughs> yeah. Think about it. Okay. But uh, yeah, so he was, he's a funny dude. And my sister's uh, pretty funny. And, but I was like the, the family clown, for sure. Who were you inspired by at such a young age? Any comedians or anything on TV? That well, you... Steve Martin was big for me, and right. Woody Allen. Right. Those were big, 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 like, towers for me. Did you have some in your family that showed you those comedians? Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, all my, my family were big Woody Allen heads, they all, all of them. They would, uh, you know, get, they would talk about his movies. And I guess when we first got a VCR, when I was 10, sure. when the Betamax came into the house, the first tapes we got were, you know, uh, pirated tapes of The Front and um, right. Sleeper and some of the earliest Woody Allen, Take the Money and Run. It's interesting you said The Front, one of the few movies early on that he... He didn't direct. Or write. Or write, just acted. That's right. Actor for hire, maybe one of the very few times. But so written for him. I mean, one of my favorite Woody Allen movies is Played Against Him, which he didn't direct. Right. But he, uh, those movies, you know, the, it, people today will never know this. People of younger generations will never understand this, but we got the VCR, and it was so primitive and so new, and we had, I probably watched the same five or six movies a hundred times, because that's what we had, and it, was, it wasn't like download, grab, easy, easy, you know, stream, channels. TiVo, none of that. So I watched Heaven Can Wait and Ragtime, just randomly, whatever I had, right. Animal House, and then all the Woody Allen movies, and then the Steve Martin specials from NBC over and over and over again to the point where they just seeped into my bones forever. Yeah. And like, I, I, I'm, as I'm writing or talking at any point, turns of a phrase come out from those things, random little sketches that, you know, right. they, I can't help it. Right. That's what's in my bones. And that all happened at wildly young ages. 10, 9, 8, 9, 10, 11. Right. And then by 11 or 12, 
my father uh, brought home a video camera that he had that his office had and was never using. Uh, one of these old first time, you know, two giant machines that have to be hooked up to it in order for it to turn on. Yeah, it's this thing on yeah. the shoulder. This thing on the shoulder, this thing on your strap, and then the other, the power block was the, the size of another VCR. Uh, and I just went to town on that. I, lo I loved, and I just, I would c come home every night and make shows like this, basically, by myself, though. Uh, and I would, it's the David Wayne show, Cleveland Rocks, da -da -da, and just make up characters, and, uh, but no one ever saw it, barely. Except for I did one, there was this guy, uh, my sister was dating a much older guy who was 26 when she was... Uh, of age. 18, something like that. And uh, he was a kind of a comedy fan. And he, was, he, would, he introduced us even more, I think, to Steve Martin stuff. And he became sort of a major force in, in my... Uh, Education? My, my progression right. into, the, into show business, ultimately. You say nobody saw those tapes from the basement. They would watch. My, sister, my youngest sister, Kathy, and her boyfriend, John, they would come down and watch after going out. They would, like, want to see what I did. Well, it's time for everyone else to see what you did. We have a clip oh, no, no. from... No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... Could the, they exist? They're around and someday, somewhere. But, you know, a lot of times they're better to be remembered in, in a story. And yes. <laughs> in fact, I did once, uh, once on My Damn Channel, they, they wanted more Wainy Days. That's the, where I do Wainy Days. Right. They wanted something one week and I had, couldn't do anything. So I'm like, put, take something from my archives when I was 10 years old. And one of my favorite things I remember. And I looked and I put it online and then I sort of was embarrassed because it's, it's not that funny. Is it there now? No, I don't think so. You took it down? Yeah. It was called Mrs. Hitler. And I put on my mom's like uh, clo you know, robe and stuff, and I put on a ton of makeup and a wig, and I was like, I'm Mrs. Hitler. It was so stupid. <laughs> and then, of course, my big thing was then I would walk out of frame, hit pause on the camera, take a shower, put on my regular clothes, you know, wipe off the makeup, and then walk back in, you know, hit pause again. So it was as if it all happened in real time, and I thought that was the coolest. You were editing in camera? Always editing. Sure. I would, but I shot like 20 minute shorts edited in camera, you know, with all sorts of crazy. Shit. And fluid. <laughs> so very, very fluid. No jumping around at all. Uh, so you're class clown for the family. Are you also class clown at school? Yeah. Because that's a big difference. The comfort of home and family versus performing for total strangers. I toggled between painfully shy and class clown. Mm -hmm. And probably still do right. to this day. Right. Like many comedians, I well, guess. Well, if you watch Wayne Days, there is a genuine... Um, under um, tone, undertone, undertone. I would say of of someone who's allowing themselves to be silly and forcing themselves to be silly, mm -hmm. uh, which comes off very real. It's not an act, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. How much fun is it for you to actually cut up on camera? Are, are you toggling it still to this day? This sort of need to be funny man and and, and embarrassed. I guess so. I mean, I, get, I feel like I've arrived at a certain amount of confidence in no question. what I do and who but I am. But can you enjoy it? Yeah. Oh, Good. yeah, totally. I love it. I mean, I, I take a lot more joy in all my work than I ever did. And, right. Um, although I still have conflicts about how hard it is, like how much, how much time and pain in the ass and physical effort it is just to get stuff done. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I, but I love it. I really do love it. And I, do, and I love the tech of it. I love editing, and I, love, I just love... The, the process, and I love my job, and I'm very lucky. Well, well, the dossier suggests that your love of tech and and prep and detail uh, fueled your becoming a director back at the uh, the NYU when nobody really wanted to look after details and whatnot, and they would say, "Ask David; he'll figure it out." Yeah. And it sort of became you were the curator for a lot of the details and a lot but of But I would do, I often would take care of details that didn't need taken care of. That was the classic nerd thing I would do. Like, I will, you know, organize and alphabetize all of the sketches on index cards. And they're like, okay, <laughs> okay whatever. You know, like, do that. And so I, I can, to this day, I very often am like, you know, finding new productivity systems on the Mac to organize everything on the Google Docs for the editing for a children's hospital. And people are like, okay, fine, you know, or we can just do it, you know? Right. So I, I find myself needing to put a check on that stuff, but I enjoy it. You know, like, what's the right font for the script? What is the right font for your script? Not Courier. I have a lot of opinions about the way things are done in film. 
and that, that are, are you know, vestiges from long before there were computers. What are these uh, opinions uh, at, uh, informed by? They're just informed by my, me feeling like a, a growing feeling that we should, we should embrace certain tools of technology uh, that, uh, like we should acknowledge, for example, all movie scripts are written in a typewriter font because typewriters were the way you wrote scripts 50 years ago. It's ridiculous now. It's not as readable. It's not a readable font, and it's not, a, it's not the, the ideal formatting, and it's also really hard to port from one place to another. And so I have, I have a lot of opinions about that. Nobody wants to hear it. But. Oh, I do. <laughs> uh, don't back away from I it basically, now. Here, my, my overall theory Please. is that the software that's used to write a script and the software that's used to edit a, fi a finished film, and the software that the script supervisor uses on set, and the software that's used to do a sound mix, and the software that's used to make a schedule and budget for the movie. Currently, those are all completely separate foreign things to each other. That should be one piece of software, and each one pulls the data and uses it as it should. It, it's, the technology is there today, but the will is not yet. Interesting. This is, this is going to be one of my, when I have time, Thank you. I wrote an entire script in Wingdings. No, it did no, not go not well. Not good. Nor Comic Sans. Yeah. Wingdings, no good. Wingdings, Wingdings three actually. My next script I'm writing in Chicago. <laughs> I like Chicago. The musical? Nope. The font. Oh. The style, as it were. Thank you. Um, the biopic. We or have biopic. a burgeoning filmmaker in the other room, our Josh Negrin, who was applauding there. Big fan from watching the show. Uh -huh. I know he's doing the stuff behind the scenes, <clears throat> figuring out the streaming. Right. He, he saved he, us. He, he, Josh is going to dine out now for two and a half years because David Wayne just said big fan. Yeah. I hope that'll I be hope his closer for six for months at least. Yep. Oh, yeah. Will it bring him down to size if I say I was lying? No. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Too late. Yes. He's already edited that Son out. Son of a bitch. <laughs> um, That's talent on a live stream. <laughs> to edit it out mm -hmm. that oh, quickly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you ever worked with the TriCast with the live editing from different camera angles? It's like TV from the 50s. I mean, yeah, not really. In school, we did a little bit of that, but I not really. Uh, I've worked on shows. Like, I mean, I was, in, I was an intern on the David Letterman show when oh, I was, so when you I was 20 years old. Yeah. So I've watched that happen. Please tell us a little bit about interning on David Letterman's show when you were 20. I was so excited. I, I mean, I, right before that, I was at Brown University, and I was watching. I was just obsessed you know, every night. Letterman and later with Bob Costas. Yeah. I'd watch cover to cover, just never stopped, and, the, and I was such a fan. And so I uh, just wrote in and said, I'm a random dude, can I get an internship? And they said yes, and I spent the summer just in the office there. And I think you know, most of the interns are basically kept away from Letterman and the writers and the shoot. <laughs> like They're doing the most grungy work. And I mostly was doing that too, but I charmed myself into getting onto the set sometimes and being around some of the action. And, um, mostly I was doing personal favors for various producers, but yeah, I loved it. I loved it. To oh. walk into 30 Rock every day because you were supposed to be there for work With a badge. was such a thrill. And in fact, it, I, I had such a full circle moment because I had interviewed to do an internship on Saturday Night Live that same summer, and going into 30 Rock that first time with a pass to go up to the 17th floor, you know, the, uh, people like me and like most comedy people, you spend your life growing up wherever you grow up studying and knowing every minutia of how Saturday Night Live works and how those great, you know, and so to go up that elevator, that, those floors, and, and walk down those hallways, I was, my heart was beating. It was so exciting. This is when I was 20 years old. And then I did, so I ended up working at Letterman. Um, and then only two weeks ago, I had a, a whole new milestone, which was to, I was the, a guest on Jimmy Fallon. Right. And I got to, uh, and I don't usually do this sort of thing, and so here I am walking in under that, auspice and that was just so awesome you know I, I've done little things at NBC. Also at 30 Rock the Fallon. Right also at 30 Rock exactly so to go into 30 Rock and go up there not as an intern not for a meeting not for some random thing but to be a guest on a talk show like you know late night and it's the technically it's the same show that Letterman was hosting when I entered it's late night. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty great though. It no, was no, awesome. Those, those that was, moments in time are pretty fantastic. That was, and it was, it's been a while, honestly, since I've had that kind of like, wow, for myself moment, where I was like, oh, this is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I would think so. And I've had a lot, I mean, I've, I've been so lucky to do so many things where I am pinching myself and being like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is my life. Meeting filmmakers that you admired or studied growing yeah. up? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I wish I met 
and got to know, and I'm, wor I'm actually working on doing that more consciously, is getting to know other filmmakers, because directors don't have a lot of reason to meet each other. You know, right. you're usually working in your own fiefdom. Um, but you know, the Directors Guild in New York has a dinner every year where they invite all the feature directors to just have dinner together. And so th I've done that the last few years, and it's really awesome. Oh, um, anyone there the last go around that you may have? Oh my God, it would, like the directors that live in, I was like, who, what directors live in New York City? I should be in LA. And it's like, oh, it's only Steven Soderbergh and Jonathan Demme and Scorsese. You know, Scorsese and Spike Lee and Nora Ephron and Steve Buscemi and you know, Don, John Hamburg and Darren Aronofsky and blah, blah, blah. It's incredible. Um, and I was the only one in the room that wasn't famous. Like, it was, <laughs> it was totally awesome. Yeah. But uh, I've gotten to, you know, like I do the show Children's Hospital and we work with Henry Winkler, who when I was younger was the only thing I th cared about. Like, you know, he was the coolest person, not, not the coolest character on TV, the coolest person on earth. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'll give you a, a good example of that coolness as it exists to this day, and then you tell me uh, what it's like having him on the set of Children's Hospital. Uh, we have Easter coming up in, I think, five weeks or less. That's and, all I um, think about. Yeah, I know. As a, a God-fearing Jew, I imagine you would think about that. Don't get me started. He was here Easter two years ago conducting one of these chats when we had an earthquake on Easter Sunday. We have a clip of it on, on YouTube where he and I are chatting like this and an earthquake uh, decides to visit. And Henry Winkler was not only cool and funny, but it was one of those rolling ones that lasts a little too long. And much like the Fonz, he finally hit the table and it stopped. Oh no, come on. Well, that part's made up. Wow. Rudder's embellishment at the end, but the rest of it is true. I edit out the part where you say it's made up. <laughs> yeah. No, he um, was the coolest thing ever. And so tell me what it's like having him on Children's Hospital because he is so enamored to be a part of that show. He's so funny. and Talks so, about it all I mean, the time. You know, I think it's always been the case. At the time, he was nothing like the Fonz. You know, he's always, I think in real life, he's always been this very, open, sweet, Jewish, whiny, nerdy, New Yorky type. Yeah. And this, you know, the, how, how, it's so rare if you think about it, how many people have really that level of success in sitcom playing a character that's nothing like them? Right. It's very rare. Extremely Usually rare. That's a you good play point. a character that's very similar to yourself, that's how you become a great sitcom star. So, he, he, I mean, there, there was almost no overlap. He's, he's totally different, but, but the sweetest, the coolest, funniest, guy and it's awesome to work with him yeah and to be able to any to direct him and it's, it's it doesn't make sense and, and then with Wanderlust to have somebody like Alan Alda on set was a similar like what what's going on you know how did that come about he was just a shoot the moon choice how much do you guys cast when you're writing very little right very little we ca uh, this one we somewhat had Paul Rudd in mind and we had Justin Thoreau somewhat in mind right. for the characters they played and otherwise uh, you know, we just try to be free with, because you never, you never know what characters are going to even sure. get cut and changed and moved around. But um, then you make your wish list. Then you make a wish list. Alan Alda was like number one. Like, we have time. Let's put an offer out. Obviously, it's not going to happen. Did you use the phrase "Let's get a no from him first, and then we'll move on"? Exactly. I mean, that's the no. <laughs> let's get. Let's get a quick no. That's my new. And thing. we got a very quick no. Did you? Um, which was his agent saying no. You know, and then I basically didn't take that. I, I decided to take it one more step and I said, listen, I, I'm such a fan. I see him in this role and I, a little note to the agent saying, just, is there any way we can, I could just talk to him and pitch it to him. And then I got a received back a response from Alan Alda personally saying, well, let's talk. I, it is really funny. It just might be a scheduling thing. And, and we coincidentally happened to both be uh, have plans to be in Chautauqua, New York that weekend. I'll say. Randomly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we sat down and talked and he was cooler and smarter and funnier than I, even I had imagined and the rest is history. How's your water level? I've got more down here. I'm good. No, and I, and I have this secret stash of iced tea. Look how much I have. <laughs> wow. That is a secret stash. <laughs> how much did I embarrass you that you had to put these on? These lights are killing my eyes. <laughs> right, so she's never going to make it in this business. I didn't even notice I them. Think, like, I can't. I'm like seeing floaters. I can't. I know. I know. I look ridiculous. By the way, I'm way cooler with shades on. Don't even tell me. Baby, just, can I, I tell you something? The lights in your eyes means that people are looking. They're burning. I'll take them off and finish. What was it like the first time you said that to Jenna Rannis? <laughs> um, okay, so Alan's on board. You guys meet up. And, yeah. And it feels right. Yeah. 
Jennifer Aniston is on your wish list, and Paul knows her. He'd worked with her a couple of times. Well, yeah, as it happens, Jennifer Aniston came on board before anybody, after, after Paul. We asked Paul to be part of it. Right. He came on as a producer and as a, a star. And then uh, we, me and Ken and Paul were alone in this effort, and we went to Jennifer Aniston uh, through, uh, partly through Paul's friendship with her, and uh, they share a manager. Do you remember which one of you was the first genius to say, you know, it'd be good for this? You know, I think it was kind of an obvious first choice. Right. Like we were just like Jennifer Aniston. Like yeah. just the the part as written was just. And then I between you really and Ken, which one said, "Yeah, but we couldn't ask you, Paul, to do." It. <laughs> he played bad cop. I played good cop. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, no, yeah, and that was it, it. It was surprisingly easy how quickly once we got the script. It took us a long time, including five years of. Work uh, four years of work and making role models and doing a million other things, Children's Hospital and other things in between. And then when we got her back around to rewriting the script and getting into shape and kind of saying, okay, let's do this, mm -hmm. uh, very quickly, within a week, really, it was Paul, Jennifer, then Judd Apatow, and then the studio. Uh, Holy crap. Yeah, so, and we really didn't envision it, honestly, as a big budget studio comedy we thought of it as a smaller, me, small to medium-sized, cool comedy, you know, and... Kind of a Wet Hot American Summer. We, we were hoping something in between Wet Hot American Summer and, and a real movie. <laughs> uh, like a $10 million, right. something like that. But... Uh, what was the budget on Wet Hot? Much more than that. Much more than $10 million? Yes. Really? It was a big uh, studio. Wet Hot, he's asking about. Oh, Wet Hot. Wet Hot. Under two. $1.8 million. So you were hoping 10 would be nice for... Ten, eight to ten, for even. I don't know, but you know what? You know, we we were given an opportunity to do it with this incredible cast and with an incredibly, insanely huge, awesome producer and this studio. And I like what I read about your reasons for wanting yeah. Judd Apatow on board because you the want the desire to have a producer there who speaks the language and understands comedy and the studio system and so on and so forth. But I like what I read in the dossier that your feeling was, we also wanted someone not only that we respected, but that would challenge us to defend our stance on our material that we believed in and then learn what we really maybe didn't believe in. That was key. That was huge. And you know, I mean, because we, we did, on Role Models, we had two different producers, because right. one left in the middle, but both of them in different ways, Mary Parent and Scott Stuber, did that too. They were like, are you sure? Like, can you do better? You know, and at the time, we were like, oh, you know, Really? Do we have to rewrite this again? Or like, we have to tell her why? We, but it helped the movie. And we, when we were done, we realized we don't want to, you know, even if we have the chance to do it, we don't want to have unchecked power. We want to have somebody who's going to be like, why? Why is that? Do, why, do better, you know? And, but not someone who didn't know what they were talking about. And so yes. you get Judd Apatow, who's the master and who's like got, you know, as you said, he's a comedy writer. He's been in the trenches. He knows the deal. Um, and obviously knows how to do it right and do, do it well and do it with success. So it was, you know, that was the whole idea to bring somebody in uh, who, who would challenge us. Right. Um, so as you're defending material in certain positions like that, uh, I learned from you that there's going to be a bizarro, you're calling it, I believe, yes. ver <laughs> version of the movie <coughs> on the DVD. That's right. Uh, which means you're shooting a lot of extra stuff, or does it mean you're shooting different versions of the movie because of test results and reshoots and additional things? Or all those reasons? Sort of all those reasons. The Bizarro Cut is, a, is gonna be on the Blu-ray. <coughs> and it's... Um, Are you lying? Is that why you did that? No, that was literally a clearing of the throat. Wow. But you made it funny! And concern causing. <laughs> well... <laughs> By the way, mission accomplished. Are there any more Coke Zeros? Yes. I, I, May we please? So, Adam, speaking of interns he's, he's who up. were kind he's enough to write to us and I say, have a feeling it's I'd emotion. love to be a part of your thing. Oh, that's nice. We have the lovely uh, college student, Adam, who's busting ass for Many us. of the people who have worked for me over the years have been just people who wrote me, emailed me cold. I'm a fan. Can I come work for you? Yeah. That's initially how we got Josh Negrin as well. He just walked in off the street. And so, what are you guys doing? Yeah. That's how, that's how that happened. Um, there are never women. <laughs> there are never women They're who never, say, what are you guys doing? It's in never there? a woman. It's always a, like a bearded guy. We don't have a bearded guy. Uh, so 
I, oh, the Bizarro cut. Yes. It's really exciting to me because... Sammy, fly that right in here, will you, buddy? I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Hey, I do. Hi, why? Nice to see you. <laughs> hey, nice to see you. Big fan. Looking real good. Sammy, we're going to see you in a couple of minutes. What? Don't go too far. I'm not sure if this has ever been done exactly this, which is there's, instead of a director's cut where a few scenes are different or there's something added, the entire movie pretty much is made up of material that's not in the theatrical cut. That's crazy. So... Like, there's a great scene in the trailer where uh, Jennifer is with a couple of women. Yes. And she's saying to Paul's character, you missed everything. Here, give me that mug. I'll toss it in here, and then you can give me the mug. I'll toss it in here, and then you can use the mug. Yeah, we're going to do that. Right? You okay I, that? I prefer it. I don't want to be a big advertisement for, uh, you know, I, I have a big contract with Pepsi. <laughs> Clearly. Um, um, so, so you missed everything. I was with the two girls. Yes. Right? And People have uh, noticed that in the trailer. And there's a few things that were in the trailers that aren't in the theatrical. And by the way, that happens. That happens for other movies. This yeah. is not an anomaly, really. Well, I think, and the, the theory is definitely, th they were not worried about that. They right. feel like people know that there's a, more than just the movie you see in the theaters. And in this case, that's true. Do you feel comfortable sharing with us why that scene is out and how we yeah. can look forward to more of it in the Bizarro version? There really was a whole story thrust in that section of the movie that didn't make it into the theatrical cut, part, uh, partly because we learned in test screenings that the audience wasn't really, some people in the audience, enough, were not with it. You know, they, they, which they is basically ready to see. The Jennifer Aniston character goes on a little bit more of a sexual escapade than America was ready to see. A little bit more? A lot more. <laughs> and so... We, Who does she not sleep with? Right. In the in, in, in the bizarre, in the bizarre cut, version, there's a lot of a lot of people. She sleeps with a lot of people. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all I'm I can't say. wait to see that. I mean, yeah. when when Ken and, and you were telling oh, me about fucking it. test screenings, I know, right? Well, but I'm telling you, you know what? This is great. Go see the movie in the theater, right. And then buy it on DVD, and then there then you get it all. Yeah. But uh, but I mean, I get it when I think Ken first told me. That you know what would, what had happened. I asked about what does that scene in the trailer. What happened? And the whole storyline, how uh, she doesn't just make a mistake once. She she's with pretty much everyone. Yeah, she and, goes on a tear. Yeah, she's she gets also within 24 hours, right? That yeah, was, I mean the story the story is well, you know, in our earlier drafts, it all happened the first night they arrived, but um, basically the story is about how they go to this commune and she's apprehensive and Paul Rudd's really into it and then but, and it's a free sex thing and she's really skeptical about that but then finally he convinces her to embrace it and then she over embraces it mm -hmm. uh, and then she drinks too much Kool-Aid yeah. yeah and the over embracing part is the part that for certain audiences we went too far yes. and so we did some reshoots and some changes to pull that back but some of it got into the trailer and some of it uh, and all of it is on the, is on the bizarro cut well, it's interesting during the um, <clears throat> pre-production process when you have a script and you've got a few notes in the studio and you've got notes from some of the actors maybe. Um, everyone was on board at that point with one of America's sweethearts sleeping around. And then you shoot it, or maybe they were saying, you know what, let them shoot it, we'll see what it looks like, we don't need to judge. I'm suspecting that the studio was more the latter. They were like, we're not sure about this, but okay. Let's, let's see what it looks let's like. Let's see what happens, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, certainly by so I measure they were right. You know, it wasn't quite something that a lot of people were okay with. In terms of the relationship between these two characters, speaking only as a man, um, because I refuse to speak as a woman anymore since the trial. Um, you know, Michael. When Dorsey. the woman you love goes too far, it is without question a little more difficult to forgive all those trespasses. Well, that's true. Uh, but one of the things that was a fascinating topic, which I have no hard answers on, throughout our writing, shooting, and editing process was the various standards we have for men versus women on all of these issues. Without question. And, you know. And let's not forget that it's a farce. Right. Well, that's the other thing. But, like, you know, the charge of, and also then there's a woman and then there's a big movie star like Jennifer Aniston. Exactly. And then there's Paul Rudd and then there's a man and there's what, what when the husband does something versus when the wife does something. And it was fascinating, actually, to look at the test screenings to the degree that you can trust that they have mean anything, where, you know, there were, there were certain cuts of the film where everyone hated Paul and was very with Jen. And there was other ones where it was the opposite. And so we really could tweak it really dramatically just with one line here, one scene here, or take this one event out. So, I mean, that's the amazing thing about editing in general. It's, it's a couple of frames off a, a joke makes it funny versus not funny. And, Sometimes. How much of that part of the puzzle do you enjoy? We had, uh, it's my favorite part. 
one of my heroes here, Christopher Guest, who, who when we were talking about what many of us called the final rewrite, the editing process, um, in his films that are wildly improvised, the Guffmans and whatnot. How about 90 hours of film? Oh, yeah. And then how do we come up with 90 minutes? Uh, it's well, it's the not ultimate... cutting it down, it's building it f right. from scratch. Always. And that's true even in a more traditional movie, I think. Even in a more conventional narrative, you're still, you're just, it, it, it's not the final rewrite, it's, the, it's one of the most important drafts. It's just, you know, once the shoot is done, and then you, put, you forget about the shoot, and now you just look at your raw material and you say, what is this? And let's figure it out. And it's really fun. You love the puzzle. I do love the puzzle. I, it, as with any puzzle, it has its frustrating moments and, you know. There's always a piece missing. What happened to the, yeah, exactly. the dog's tail? But, uh, you know, what I, one of the things I like and want to, I think is a, we should be doing more of is now that cameras are so cheap and easy to use, or easy to, to get going and stuff, we, we should be able to be doing reshoots and pickups of moments and scenes more organically throughout the post process without having to, like, make it a big deal. Make it a big deal. And you did reshoots on this. You found little there were some reshoots. Little beats that were missing from the puzzle. Yes, or or wanted to change. One of them involves, let's just call it for lack of better terms, the nub of Joe's character. Uh, what, uh, yeah, was there a reshoot involving that? I don't think so. so someone <laughs> at the premiere, I thought it was Ken said, or maybe it was Joe said. When um, Paul's character wakes up and there's a nub dangling close to his face, that right. was in fact part of a reshoot. No, that's no? not true. Okay, <laughs> there was there was a lot of re-edits there. Ah, uh, the, 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 we, it's, it's not a big secret. In the, it's not a big spoiler of the movie. How much of the nub? There's a scene where Paul Rudd wakes up uh, after having had a nightmare, and in his face is Paul Rudd's giant cock. Not Paul. I mean, uh, Joe. Jo well, Freudian yeah. slip. <laughs> because I know I, I often suck Paul Rudd's cock. It's not important. Um, so. Now it slipped again. Joe is standing Damn. at the table. She's, he's I'm standing at the, at the head of at the bed, so that his penis is at Paul Rudd's eye level, right, right in his face. And all Joe's character has done is to uh, uh, come up to the side of the bed the way anyone normally would to to either wake someone or say yeah. breakfast is ready. And he's but in saying, this case, we've been making because, pancakes because Joe's character is a nudist. Right. He happens to be standing there naked, and the shot is sort of over him, dirty, literally. Right. Uh, past the, the nub of his penis onto Paul's face. That's right. the first angle you, we th see. We, we call it the mushroom cap shot. Do we? Uh, that's I should we, stop saying nub. <laughs> I didn't realize we were going with mushroom cap. Is mushroom cap in or out? You know, well, because we were saying, like, how many shots of nudity can we take out and still have a movie? And then the, but we're like, but mushroom cap is so great. Put mushroom cap in. I beg of you to at least name one chapter in a future book. Yes. How much of the mushroom cap to shot? I will do I it. I beg of you. <laughs> um, and in fact, one of the things that Judd taught us, which was really interesting, is he, we would do side-by-side uh, -side test screenings. And one was like the current cut, what we think is the best, tightest version of the movie. And the other one was the kitchen sink, every joke we could f find and think of. Uh, and it was way too long and terrible. But you figure out where the big laughs come and you put those back into the, into the tight cut. So Mushroom Cap got a big laugh. So we're like, oh, let's put it in. Put it back in. But the way it was shot, though, yeah. originally, wasn't over Joe's butt with the little Mushroom Cap out onto Paul's face. It was Paul's point of view, cock in face, <laughs> in lens, in and frame. there is the, one of the great debates about comedy, and and giving credit again to Cam Reno in terms of do you see it as the visual or the written joke? Right. Who's re is the reaction to the penis funnier than actually seeing the penis? Because if you see just uh, one character's POV without the perspective and without that person's take on it in the instant, you've only got one reveal. Right. Right. Which reveal right. do you want? That's right. Uh, a, I, I know that you formed that in the question, but my answer to you is that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's quite. It's well, that's the amazing thing, and, you, and it's very hard to predict sometimes. But that's the the art of what we do sometimes is to try to do your best to predict or at least come up with some options that you think one of them is the right way, and then you're so right sometimes. And that's what we found is you start a scene on. You know, there's this another scene in the movie where it was, it's revealed that the car has been into the lake. And there's 14 ways to start that scene and reveal, you know, which, is it the fourth shot in that you do it, the first shot in? And each one has a different way of getting to the joke. A different reason for being funny. A different reason for being funny. Or maybe isn't funny. So Yeah, I heard there's a version of it, I assume in the bizarre one, he says, cut to, and Paul says, no, no, about 
seven times. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's in the bizarre. That he won't finish telling the story. He just right. keeps saying cut to. Right, right. Nah, 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 nah. No cut to. Tell me what happened. Jordan Peele. Yeah, it's, yeah that's, one of my, that's one of my favorite scenes because it's sort of a very pure kind of us type of voice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you know Jennifer Aniston before you started shooting the movie? No, I had had one uh, coffee with her uh, a year before when she was, wanted to meet uh, on some project. She had seen role models and like mm -hmm. it. Uh, otherwise, no. So, um, I'm trying to think about uh, the films. I guess you've had, well, I mean, there's only so many uh, <laughs> uh, uh, actresses or actors that they call, one of the nicknames for them is Bank. Right. Um, that they represent a very short list that the studio will say, oh, okay, we know how to market a movie starring Blank. Right. And these small handful of people who shift over time, mm -hmm. the fact that Burt Reynolds was banked for 10 years yeah. is, at the time, was kind of absurd. <laughs> um, the fact that uh, some of these people are banked for different reasons, international, what have you. So when you get a shot, and in this case, a wish list, and within a week, you have a member of the bank list on your team, part of the sphincter uh, relaxes mm -hmm. in terms of and then, once you start to spend time with these people creatively, how wonderful is it when things start to sync up and line up? Well, it's amazing. I mean, I mean you can make assumptions that, in this case, Ms. Aniston knows her way around it. Well, you know, here's a woman who's, you know, did a top-notch TV show for 10 years, you know, and then, uh, you know, just has a big sense of knows, knowing what she's doing. Instincts, instincts. <laughs> instincts. Yeah. And then also, you know, she was such in her in her air and her way of being that you really could forget about her bankability and her the world around her and the paparazzi and the, how, how famous she is and the the Jennifer Aniston uh, corporation and you could just think of that this is a, a young woman who, uh, who is an actress who you're working with with Paul on a set with a camera and trying to figure out the best scene and that was such a, a pleasure and uh, it's not always that way. So it was so nice that she was just really sweet and approachable, and you could talk to her, and we could, you know, just have fun. I asked Joe uh, Latrulio when he sat here how loud um, things got uh, in the after hours, uh, and that's when I found out that instead of staying in a nearby hotel or whatever, as you shot in the suburbs of Atlanta, I think. Right. That, well, it was out in the mountains. Out that, in the mountains. That's why, you know, I I heard him talk about how we did not all stay in a hotel. They no, basically you guys got had everyone a cabin or a house on this lake or on some lake. Right. And but then they would all gather up in Joe's house or Paul's house and and party till six a.m. many nights. Where and I used the word they because I was working. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I would go home after we shot a, d and a day, and I would work with Ken and rewrite the whole next rest of the script again. Usually, do you and cut? Then pass out at while you shoot. Someone assigned. I wasn't doing much cutting. In fact, our edit room stayed in L.A., and I was getting seeing scenes as they you know they would email me scenes all the time, and I would give a few notes. But I just that was one thing I didn't have time to think about. But so your editor was back in L.A. assembling a little bit. Yeah. And sending you actual scenes. Yeah, I was getting scenes every day. But uh, like I said, I, I would only give back so much. And, uh, ideally, I you think. You did more collecting than conversing. Yeah, but uh, part of the main thing I did was identify huge problem areas that might involve wanting to reshoot a shot or, you know, redo a scene. If, I don't think we ever did that. But, you know, or just seeing how scenes are coming out so I can adjust the approach, you know, look mm -hmm. at people's performances, look at the way it's being shot, look at the, everything. And it helps me to understand, because I never really watch dailies uh, much either. So I just because get a sense of what we're shooting. Honestly, I don't know when I would do it. Because, you know, par part of it is it's because- It's a time problem. It's a time problem, but it really has to do with the fact that in a traditional film in the old days, you shoot very much less per day, and then you finish, and then you can watch dailies from the, you know, the footage from the night before, or the day before. In, in um, these kind of comedies, you're shooting so much. You're rolling off rolls of film as people riff and improv, and you do alts on alts and alts and different versions of things. So it would take hours to watch every day's yeah. footage. Yeah. Uh, and because of the nature of that, there's so much prep involved for each day 
that I spend hours after every shoot day figuring out the next day. Right. So, that, uh, yeah. And also in a sense, uh, for, for me and, and others I've talked to, one of the joys of getting out of your own way when you're writing the first draft of a script is knowing that the fun and the ultimate achievement comes from the rewriting. So I have to wonder if something similar happens in you as a filmmaker while you're shooting, you know how many hours you're going to be spending editing later anyways. Do you need to assemble so much in your mind? And do you need to uh, rather see so much of dailies? Does that play in, into it at all? I guess so. Because you know you're going to rewrite the hell out of it later. I guess post. so. But I mean, obviously, the, the, the idea of the shooting, though, is to, to create your best clay for the edit room. And yeah. so you have to think about how it's going to get cut. And you have to have an editor's mindset on set. Because well, you learned cutting in camera as a ten-year-old. Exactly, and you and I learned through so many things, whether it's Wayne Days in the state and Stella and everything, I, how to do things really fast with very few resources. So, because even on a bigger budget film, you're always making compromises on the day every time, and so you have to make the right decisions and say, no, we have to get this. I don't care how much we go into overtime, we have to get this or this. No, we don't, we can do without that, or we can combine those seven shots into one shot, or we can okay, we can't. Change the location, or shoot both these scenes in the same place, or you know, blah 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 blah. That's all you do all day. It's just like it's like playing Missile Command. But you love it. Well, now that I'm talking about it like this, I think I, maybe I hate it. <laughs> was that J Mac laughing from Missile Command? I was, and it was just a reference. Yeah. I think maybe I'd rather. I, I do have this sort of anti fantasy about working at Kinkos, where T tell me about it. I really do. I, like I wanted to work behind the counter, and like people come in, they want X number of copies. They Hi, tell where's me how the uh, three hole? Yeah, and here it is. Okay. And then this, and then, and then five o'clock. Goodbye. Don't think about it. It's over. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I'll be back tomorrow. And there's something about that uh, grass is greener kind of thing where I'm just like, that sounds awesome. When you're working at Kinkos, how often do you get a chance to work and meet and hang out with Paul Rudd and Jennifer Aniston? Yeah, but I mean, you know. No, I don't. R Rudd's in Kinkos every day. Yeah. That they, guy doesn't have a computer. Kinkos whore. Look, somebody sends Jennifer Aniston a script. Uh, for, for her next film. She's going to want to maybe have a second copy of it. She'll walk to Kinko's. Yeah. No way she's sending that with her assistant. That's also, crazy her, talk. her headshots. Hello? She wants to get her headshots printed out. Got to have copies of the headshots. You know, she also, How's I know she going to get work? I know that Jennifer Aniston also has these uh, business cards she makes, and she's always redoing them with like you know, her new cell phone or like you know, her new uh, agent or website. What is Julia, how does Julia Kay pronounce her name? Oh, Aniston. Jennifer Aniston. Aniston. My mother's one of those. She likes to, you know, like mispronounce everything. She just gets My dad slightly too. wrong. Yeah. So it's it's been, and no matter how many times you tell her, it's Jennifer Aniston. Yeah. It's my mother. But I think it's also because my mom doesn't really care for her. Oh, so really? I think it's, it's a judgmental thing. So I think I'm going to say like, her name slightly differently because yeah, I'm not a fan. A Anastasios? My father, when he, uh, yeah. when I, I first moved is. to New York, he said, uh, tell me if you ever run into Mayor Koch. Because <laughs> he learned, he knew everything he knew from reading the Times, not from ever, why he didn't watch a lot of TV. Mayor Koch. So, and he would just read it and as assume pronunciations. Mm -hmm. Tell me if you ever run into, first of all, pronouncing it correctly, it's still a fun thing. Tell yeah. me if you ever run into the mayor of the city. Won't you, David? Well, and the irony was that I actually did run into him a fair amount because that happens that a friend of mine lived in his building. It happens. Yeah, fascinating story. Uh, someone from the NYU happened to live in his building? Uh, no, a friend of mine who didn't go to NYU. <laughs> Perfect. Um, <laughs> Tell, let's, let's go back. I could regale you with these kinds of anecdotes all day. <laughs> Please, this is what the show's built on. Yes. Um, and we don't edit. Great. Yeah, we hadn't. I should say we hadn't edited. <laughs> um, mm. 11 of you in the state, yes? Yeah. Okay. 11 headed beast. Uh, we've done the NYU at the table. We haven't done too much of the state at the table. Uh, so let's talk about a couple things, if you don't mind. Um, the, the one thing you, uh, I grabbed from a previous conversation that I, I love this. Or as, I, as we sometimes say in the business, convo. Yes, previous convo. You said you've been greatly influenced by the fact that during your seven years with the state, every sketch, every word you wrote was credited to the state. Have I said that? Yeah. Be uh, <laughs> apparently, according to the research, yes. when you were on the show and everyone was contributing sketches, not just yourself. Well, it definitely was a great way to put away the thought about credit. I, me, my, mine. And yeah, and it helped us. 
the state was formed. Uh, Much like communism. And I know Joe mentioned this last time uh, by this guy, Todd Hollebeck, who really infused immediately this full democratic, all consensus, one for all uh, ethos. And it was great. And it really did help us. So we, we really functioned as a group, as a group, as a group. The group is all that matters. And it was amazing that as uh, a, a group that is as talented as everyone was, that we were able to stick together and people in the group turned down opportunities to fly off for, you know, we were together seven years before anybody did anything else. That's absurd. It wasn't like, you know, UCB where like they're together but they do a million things. No, we were just doing that. And when we, when we had a day off from MTV, we would either have a vacation together or we would work on some other project together as a group of 11. And every single decision was made by consensus of 11 people talking about it in a room. And so it was, thinking about it now, the it's energy. It's an unparalleled experience. It was nuts. Yeah. But it was amazing. And so we really learned everything from each other. And, we, and it was great that it didn't matter who wrote the first draft of whatever and who rewrote it, because we were just like, it's all written by us. Right. Um, while you're during those seven years, SNL tapped on the door of a couple of you, I imagine? I think so, not in a huge, huge way. I think if, if, if SNL had said, we want Michael Ian Black, he probably would have gone, and I wouldn't, nobody would have blamed him. Right. Uh, but there was definitely little nibs, and, but I think, uh, you know, luckily not enough to break up the group. Well, and then once it becomes a hit on MTV, yeah. now you've not only taken a sketch show from in front of an audience, but to a much larger audience, a different audience, a younger audience than you, I think, were writing for and designing this live stage show for. Well, the live stage show was designed for our classmates at NYU, really. That we, we weren't, we weren't really all of that much of a professional group. We were a I'll college say. group, <laughs> and still aren't. Uh, and so, you know, we were we were doing the the pilot for MTV when we were 22 and 23. Yeah, and through that success, CBS comes calling. Yeah, it wasn't exactly like that. It was we had the success, and then we basically had um, we we ourselves were faced were given an offer to stay at MTV and to increase our budget and and our salaries and do more episodes. Which after how many years? After four seasons, but some of the seasons were only six twenty-minute episodes. Right. So it was like doing one big one or two seasons of a right. show, and. We, in our young, cocky way... Well, you're in mid-20s. This is the time to fuck off. Well, we were just like, no, fuck you. We are a network <laughs> sketch comedy group. And MTV is not a network. And MTV is not a network. And, you said you know, to them at the time. Screw you for being our home. And so we basically then courted and got a deal, first at ABC, which our agents at the time uh, played such hardball on the deal that it fell apart. Nice. And then we went to CBS late night, uh, but, we, but, but the deal at CBS, which was in retrospect Horrible. such a terrible idea, was to do primetime Friday night special on CBS, which was the network of murder she wrote at the time. Yes, uh, and still is, the Tiffany network specializing in, in older yeah. demographics. It was but you would think that the dumbest thing. this was the time for the agents to actually do their job and be superstars, which is to say, forget the money, forget the back end, forget this for the moment. Let's focus on, you cannot put the state on in primetime television. You have to, if they're going to go late night, let's commit to kicking SNL's ass. They haven't really been threatened, well, the seriously. Yeah. The idea was we were going to do four primetime specials as and if a they warm worked, up to going up against SNL. If they worked, right. you would be able to go into late night, Saturday nights. But I will tell you, we were cocky. We had two manager slash producers who were also very much like, it's all about us owning the show. And that was their big priority. And I will say, uh, to his credit, and I will say his name because it's to his credit, James Dixon, our agent at the time, said, you guys are crazy. Stay at MTV. They're offering you to continue this hit show. What are you doing? And we all were like, what year was this? 1990. Exactly. Cable didn't really exist as a place for original programming. Not really. Well, we were the first show on MTV 
that did production of any kind. It was exactly. all news packages or videos. Right. And you know the fact that we wanted to hire a makeup artist, they were like, "What?" You know. Yeah. See, it's different when when AMC makes a transition from showing movies to being scripted television, but they get branded in their first season by Mad Men. Right. It's much different. MTV had been branded. Right. And so you're the first scripted show, really. We were always a black sheep on that network, too. You don't know what too. the fuck to do. It's like, oh, that thing. Yeah, it was so like... So you kind of had freedom, probably. We had... It was interesting. We had a lot of restrictions that we thought were terrible at the, at the beginning, but they weren't. But right. then uh, towards the, the third and fourth season, we didn't even have those. We were genuinely left to do whatever we want. And we were getting really good ratings for the network at the time. So of course you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> And it was it was it was interesting, and, but you know we were still black sheep. Like we couldn't get invited to the Video Music Awards, and we you know we were also, but we we fostered that image ourselves. We were rebels there, and we were like, you know, vandalizing the office practically. Was, you were punks. Yeah, we were young punks. You were twenty-something turk punks, for God's sake. That's like fuck it. Uh, <laughs> hey, like fuck it. Um, Ninety-seven, the uh, the state has reached its end, and now we have you, Ian, Michael Ian Black, Michael Showalter, form Stella. Right. Uh, I should say the state run, ends its run for the time being. Well, yeah, the state fell apart in a pretty dramatic way, which was that three of the guys, three, four, four of the people from the state f formed their own series pitch based on a state sketch and took it to Comedy Central without the rest of the group. And so that was a big schism of, and there was a lot of bad blood there, which has long since been repaired. but. Uh, so that at that point, the state activity, which would, at that time was we were, had just recorded an album, we wrote a book for Disney, and we were trying to develop a movie, and we were looking at other TV products. All that just ended, and we all said, OK, we're all off on our separate ways. Good luck, everybody. But sort of separately, not directly having to do with that, Michael Ian Black and Michael Schalter and I had been doing alternative stand-up at the uh, Luna Lounge in New York, and this sort of new scene that was growing in New York and LA simultaneously. But in New York, it was Louis C.K. and Janine Garofalo and Mark Maron. And uh, so we were the younger guys at that scene. And then we just wanted to start a nightclub show that was not trying out alt material, like give alt material a real night, that, but it still isn't traditional stand up. So we got dressed up in suits and went to this fancy place called Fez. Undertime Cafe, which is no longer there. And we started doing this weekly nightclub comedy show called Stella. And uh, that's what that was. <laughs> yeah. But uh, as opposed to um, the whining era of the alternative stand up scene, which was mostly negative, mm -hmm. um, talking about all the things that piss me off right. in the world, which can be wildly funny in the right hands, right. you guys seem to have a bubbling effervescent of fun. Well, we just for Stella. we we built something that not not necessarily consciously, but just by doing comedy, it formed into our voice, which I think has a slightly more, you know, positive, silly, fun, absurdist tint, tint to it. I guess <laughs> as it should, thankfully. Yeah. Um, I'd like to involve our audience at this point. If yeah, me too. If <laughs> Because you've had enough of me. No, I just uh, want to see what, the, I like the feedback, the interaction. Sure. This from a uh, longtime fan, first time caller, uh, Corey Levin, not to be uh, confused with the Levine clan, Corey Levin. He doesn't have an E at the end. It's an easy one. The talent involved with the state has remained remarkably close over the years to the degree that I affectionately think of any film involving more than a couple of members of the ensemble as a state movie. What do you think is the magic ingredient that's kept many of you coming back together for so long? So you mentioned the, um, the chism, as it were, that, that you didn't allow to become a chasm. <laughs> um, we, uh, we witnessed, Jamie and I, um, a pretty amazing reunion at Sketchfest this year of the Wet Hot American Summer uh, stage reading. And a couple of years ago at that same festival, we had the state, the state reunion. State of the state. Where, no, just the state. I, right. I was stuttering. That's right. <laughs> oh, shit. Was it all 11 of you at the reunion? All 11 of us on stage doing brand new material that we wrote for the event. So we did an hour long, brand new set of state sketch comedy. So the question being, uh, what is the magic ingredient? Is it that you guys went through a particular journey in your early 20s together as a team in itself an unparalleled sort of life experience, creative or otherwise, 
a sort of band of brothers in Foxhole experience that will bond you forever. Is that part of the magic that or most of it? Beautifully said well. and, and exactly how I would put it. Yes, that, that's, it was all of what you just said. And it was an insane moment in time. For, I mean, for, for kids, you know, we, for, for 18 to 26 years old to spend 24 seven with this group of people that you love and make you laugh, and then we had the chance to have our own TV show, it's, it was like such a, I remember we just, it was such a ride that we knew if it was over right now, it'd still be like the greatest thing. And so it's that, but then as I've, you know, continued to go on, now I'm 42 years old, it still just happens to be the funniest people I know. So I, I'm lucky to get to work with any of them anytime, I, I think, too. And they, they, may, they still make me laugh, you know, as much as anybody ever will. The size of the group is also one of the components that's quite irregular and, and astounding. Yeah. Well, particularly since so many have gone on to so much achievement in the industry, I think. Yeah, it's the Reno 911 group. It's this. It's the Stella. It's, and it's Ken Marino. And it's Joe Luchulio. And it's basically... Um, I, you know, every, all, more than, I think seven or eight have become feature film directors, and you know, it's, it's um, very cool. Yeah, exceptionally cool. There is a, um, oh, look at this. Uh-oh. There's a regular thing on the show uh, called Tweet 5. Tweet Where's Dave five. Keckner? Tweet That's five. a funny fucker right Tweet there. Tweet 5 forever now. These are uh, rapid fire five questions designed specifically for you. Uh, Coke or Pepsi, no correct answer, this or that sort of questions. However, Coke. they are designed specifically for you, in this case, Pepsi. by Ms. Elizabeth Perkins. The, the, the Elizabeth Perkins? The, who happened to be watching, and she's uh, from the London, England, I'll have you know. But, and she was in a movie with you, right? Maybe we kind of did Avalon, Barry Levinson's masterpiece. That's what I'm talking about. Together. We who, might have. I've seen that many times. <laughs> well, I think, it, I think it's a... a prerequisite as a Jew. Yes. If you get it to a certain age, you must sit down and watch this well, film. Well, you know, my father grew up uh, underneath his father, uh, above his father's little grocery store in Brooklyn. So. No, no, I did not know that. There you go. What the hell? There you go. The <laughs> very one who would later inquire about Mayor Koch. <laughs> exactly. Uh, at Elizabeth Perkins, hey you. Uh, so ready? Here, fi uh, tweet five. Repub or Dem? Dem. Murphy or Pryor? Uh, Murphy. Bugs or Tweety? Bugs. Innie or Audi? Innie. Cake or death? Cake. Cake? Cake. Correct. Oh, you got all five right. Oh, good. That's crazy. That's good. It's so rare. Do that... I get to go to the showcase showdown? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm a, I love Elizabeth Perkins. We're huge I fans. actually used to really love Elizabeth. I mean, I, Tell us more. I had a thing for her. What kind of thing? I just was really, you know, had a crush on her. Yeah. I didn't, I've never met, I mean, you know, as a, as a fan. I'll make it happen. Okay. I will bring your kids together. I think I might have met her then, more recently, but anyway. Let's say you did. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to make it happen again. I'm going to put together a little reunion. Don't tell my wife. Nope. A and or her family. Happily you, married. You know, this is... Happily married. Who is wonderful in Wanderlust, by the She's way. She's great in Wanderlust. My wife, Sandy Hardig. Sandy is uh, the, the HBO executive yeah. in, the, uh, in the pitch session. And she's so One funny. of the worst, oh God, what a mm. horrible moment that you magically created where someone is pitching their heart out. You know, I just ran into Sue Nagel, who was my agent at one time and now is one of the major executives at HBO. And I realized that she has like the same color hair as, as Zandi. Are you now trying to suggest that there was no correlation in, from your creative input? There wasn't because I did, uh, uh, no. <laughs> because when I was watching it, being wildly familiar with the fact that Sue Nagel was running the head, the head it of really wasn't, in the company. Honestly, I didn't even, I, I never, I've never even worked with Sue in that capacity. I mm. only knew her when she was my agent. I didn't even know her that well. I think it's a good story. You should stick to it. All right, fine. Um, from the chat room, this is from Ms. Jazz. In your column for Entertainment Weekly, hello. Yes, thank you. You mentioned Paul Rudd game called Snaps. Can you teach us how to play it? Uh, <sighs> this will be a nice segue to who tweeted, by the way, so Would stand be. by. Does anyone already know Snaps? No, please help us. You, you, I can't play it alone. Somebody else has to know it, and you can't tell somebody how to play. You have to. Basically, Snaps is a game where uh, if you and I both know Snaps, then someone else can whisper the name of a celebrity in my ear. And then I can say to you, okay, Snaps is the name of the game. 
watch what I'm saying, watch what I'm saying, and then you now will be able to say what the name of the celebrity is. Based on what you just did? Based on what I just did. Wow. However. Well, that's, that's the whole thing. No, but it won't work because. I don't know how to play it. Yeah. Sit I was down. Whip. Sit down. I don't know how to play it. Sam, yeah, sit but you the have to fuck start. down. Sit down. But if he does this, Sam, I'm not going to know what celebrity I am not doing. kidding, I'm, and I'm asking you to I'm, sit I'm, down. I'm, I'm, sit fine. down. He's a Just director. Sit down. He's a director. I have to listen. God, I'm an actor. He's a director. It. I have sit to do what he says. Down. <laughs> I'm just trying to help out. And do you want more than your voice to be in the prequel of Wet Hot American Summer? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, by the way. It's already not going to happen. Um, yep. So, so I have to, have to know how to read this snapping. Right. And but, the only way to ever know is by playing it enough and figuring it out. Right. Because you don't, you, one of the rules is you can't teach it, you just have to figure it out. Wow. So next time you're with, say, me and Paul Rudd, hanging out <laughs> right. somewhere. Like Whisper in a celebrity's a name celebrity in your ear. Club. And then watch the shit that happens. Exactly. And then see if you can figure it out. Wow. Holy shit. Uh, snaps. Paul taught, Paul played it, I think, on sets or in college or with other people. He's really good at it. And <laughs> he taught it. I give him full credit. He, and then he spread it around the Wet Hot American Summer set. Uh, much so many times you've been asked, when's the sequel, when's the sequel, when's the sequel? The dossier suggests there's a <laughs> prequel, uh, possibly as a short film instead of a full feature. Where are we at, at today? The Wet Hot American Summer next installment is not a short. It will be a feature. Nice. And it is, we are writing it. How's my part? That is all I have to say. If, if it's a prequel, how do you justify me being in it and then I didn't show up in the original movie, which would be the story after, without killing my character. This is, comes under the category of creative problem solving. That's what we do. It's the puzzle. We wake up in the morning to do this work because we like to solve problems. <laughs> because we did finally work together. Uh, yes. Quite recently, and I don't know if it's something we wanna, we wanna share. Because well, I think we could just say that you, I'll say, you, okay. you're, you, you will be uh, featured in a cameo in the next season four of Children's Hospital on Adult Swim. Before that, we worked together. Oh, we worked together. Uh, you were participated in the DVD commentary of Wanderlust. Right. Right. Having not I'm been going in, the, in backwards Having order. not been in the film. Having not been in the film. Yeah. And in fact, we have decided to not keep it a secret. It's going to go on the box because <laughs> it's a big sell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and Kevin will be hanging out with me and Michael Showalt, uh, me and Ken Marino and Paul Rudd yeah. and, and you. Yeah. <laughs> Talking we, about it, a movie that you had literally nothing to do with. Yeah, you, you, you guys suggested, you and Ken suggested that I come yeah. and be a part of the DVD commentary. First I thought, well, Joe's not going to be happy at all. And then I thought, this is the craziest, strangest thing ever, sure. And it was ridiculously fun. Um, and I recommend it for others. When you're not in the movie, get in there as part of the commentary. I think, you know, commentaries can get so dry. Oh, so like, you know, for our movie, The Ten, yeah. we had my parents. On, uh, and they were not huge fans of it. And they were <laughs> not afraid to say so. Right. And it was very good commentary. And we also had a stand-up bass player. Oh. If you are interested, or your viewers, yes. check out this movie, The Ten. It has, I wrote it with Ken Marino. I it's directed crazy it. funny. It's a great movie. Yeah, there's a lot of great people And the DVD it. has that commentary. I think his area is wildly funny. He's not in it. No. Um, <laughs> tell me about Children's Hospital. But he is wildly funny. Yeah. Children's Hospital is a web, well, it started as a web series that my, uh, uh, Rob Corddry's idea. And me and John Stern and Rob developed this, and it became a web series. And then it, it's now in its third season as a TV series on Adult Swim. And it's awesome. It's been a really a super fun project. And it's, the, the cast is Malin Ackerman and Rob Corddry and Lake Bell and Megan Mullally and Henry Winkler and Ken Marino and Rob Hubel. It's this amazing cast. And then it's just basically an hour-long hospital drama squeezed into a quarter hour and very stupid. Cordry was here talking about it originally, I believe, before it went to Adult Swim. Okay, yeah. Um, so this would be, he was uh, in the first year of the show. Mm -hmm. We're going to be three years old, by the way, in a week. Mm. Um, so I believe it was, you had started to make the transition, but I don't think it had premiered yet. Now that you've been on the television in 15-minute mm -hmm. versions, uh, as Ken Marino insisted on pointing out. Well, that's only 11 minutes. There's commercials. Um, Good. Such a stickler. 
right? Such a, I would use the word asshole. Or dick. Yeah. Both acceptable. Both part of the, uh, the downstairs. As it were. <laughs> Speaking of Downton Abbey. Um, <laughs> you, know, like that. you know what, Hank Azaria was in the one, and that's where I made the confusion. Year one? Year one. The Ten, Year One. That's they're where I made not wildly different, different films. Projects, yeah. One, you've got uh, Harold Ramis at the helm, and a bad film. Yeah. Let's just it's, say it. It is bad. It's bad. horrible. The Ten, on the other hand, hilarious. They have oh, one. The they have Jason one. Antoon. That's right, Jason Antoon and Winona Ryder and Gretchen Maul. It's like forget it. Yeah, it is ridiculous. But you know who's in Paul both Rudd. movies? Paul Rudd is in both Year One and the Ten. That's also the helpful for the confusion. I think. And the number. There's a number involved. Okay, um, tell me more about Children's Hospital, what we're looking forward to other than my cameo in the new season. The new season is, uh, honestly, we've stepped it up. And it was, I, I really like Children's I like all my shit. Well, you better. But Children's Hospital this season is, is really good. We're, we're editing it right now. That's what I'm focusing on at the moment. And it's really, every episode goes in some very cool, crazy, departure into some premise and there's uh, there's an episode um, that's entirely uh, British sure with a British cast uh, and a British director and a British writer and there is uh, I'm trying to remember which ones are secret you don't mean everyone's doing British accents you no, mean no, no, everyone's are, been replaced by everyone's a British. replaced by an actual British actor <laughs> and it's shot in a different set that looks like it was made in in the UK uh-huh um, that's an example, but there's so, every ep every episode has some bizarre twist. <laughs> you direct all of them or most of them? I not even most of them. I, you know, as an executive producer, I kind of sure. co oversee everything, all the writing and all the directing and all the creation of it. But uh, as a credited director, I did uh, two this season. And fun, interesting challenges once it came to the television. Yeah, I mean, from the internet, the, it was the the. The show didn't change all that much. We, we just gave it a little more shape and just kept developing it over time. And the first 10 were five minute internet episodes and then from now on it's been this quarter hour show on Adult Swim. And so we did 14 episodes this season. And we shoot them still very fast and we shoot them- There's no money. With almost total freedom. And there's no money. Yeah, which well is that's great. what you get with but no I mean, money. You I get love, the total freedom. I love the no money. It's yeah. moving fast. You don't have time to overthink it in certain ways. But we do work our ass off, and it's you know we get to just try everything. It's really, really, and we have this cast that's hard to believe, and it's it's so fun. It's one of my I really enjoy doing it. Now you mentioned snaps, and so I believe it's time to segue into our favorite game here, the one that sweeps the nation. Yes, and continues to clean out the area with the sweeping. Who tweeted? <laughs> Have so much to say. Who tweeted? Is the game we're gonna play? Can you bring in a catheter? We meet again. Hi, Sam. Hey, buddy. How are you? Good to see you, my friend. Nice to see you. You're looking really well. I love running into you. Do you? <laughs> it's something to say. It is, but I. Uh. Mm, I. Okay. It's all right. Uh -uh. So this is who tweeted the uh. game that's sweeping the nation. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read a series of eight tweets. All of these tweets were authored by either Tyra, Paris, or Bieber. Got it. So uh, I will read a tweet. When you feel like you know who authored it, you ring in by saying your name. Okay. I will point to you. You have three seconds to say Tyra, Paris, Bieber. Got it. Ring in, you get it right. You get yourself five points. Ring in, you get it wrong. You lose three. Copy that, sir. There's a penalty for being incorrect. Understood. Lose three. I was listening. What the hell's that? That's going to the winner. What? Right that's there. That's exciting. There's money at stake? There's Jews here, so why not? This is this is what I use. I, I you got to be fast. Okay. You got to be fast. Are you ready? I'm, I was born ready, Sam. Let's do this. Here we go. Tweet number one. Loved Terry World's amazing art show. Such sexy works of art. He is a true artist and fantastic photographer. Uh, David. Yes, sir. Tyra. Sorry, no. Oh. Paris. Paris. That's okay. I should have guessed. What? All right. He starts from a hole. I think you were guessing. Tweet. Tweet number two. 
I love BBQ, but I'm watching some TV movie now where killer wasps are living in BBQ grills and attacking uh, people. David. Yes, sir. Bieber. Sorry, no. Oh, God damn. That was Tyra. That was Tyra. That was Tyra. Uh, I could have guessed. It's all right. It's all right. Still anyone's game. Very early. Very early. They're all good friends of mine. <laughs> Number three. Mr. Zoolander himself challenged me to a pose-off. What do you think? Kevin Bieber. Sorry, no! We are kicking ass! David, David. <laughs> I'm from, no, oh. only, uh, that's oh, it. That's it. Well, are you gonna tell us? Yeah, that's, uh, that's Tyra. I thought so. It's Tyra. What, once you, uh... <laughs> once someone's ra ra rang in, it's all over. I understand yeah. now. Okay. Number four. That, we're three for three on incorrect That answers. is correct. Number four. Are you really not writing the Artie character into the Wet Hot sequel? Because I... That, that can't be on there. David. You. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. I said that. That was me. I'm going to give him two points for that. Okay. <clears throat> Tweet number four. Seeing all the videos and the amazing messages from you guys. Thank you. I love you too. Uh, uh, David uh, Bieber. That is correct. Ugh, oh. Finally. Look at that. Look at that. Now I know how to play wow. snaps. That's by snaps. the way, that's got to be it. It's a clue, anyway. David Pamer. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet number five. Thanks, Ryan Seacrest, for always being a friend. Kevin Paris. Incorrect. Bieber. That's Bieber. negative nine for me, in case you're wondering Bieber. at home. No. no. Th three incorrect? Why did you get a third incorrect or a second incorrect? It doesn't matter. Oh, no, you're right. I was just two. Yeah. What? Just what? Two. What? No. Don't, don't. Do, you, you're no, always I saw wrong. you do it, right? You're no, I, I drew a line here. Yeah, this was I a total. I don't know why he insists on checking my work. All right. <laughs> negative six to plus one. <laughs> tweets number six. How many are there? Seventeen. Eight. No, just eight. Okay. Eight tweets. He has to pee. Smiling ear to ear on the Harvard Business School campus with my diploma. Thanks to my fab photographer mama for the pic. Kevin Tyra. That is correct. God damn it. You gotta be fast. Ooh. You added five for that? Yeah, it's Every correct, correct answer is plus five. Oh, five. I see. Got it. Okay. So you're still leading by two points. No, I'm, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Neg plus, Go ahead. plus one to negative one. Go ahead. Tweet number seven. Number Getting seven, excited. Kenny. I had a one in a billion chance of living my dream. Believe. Uh, uh, d David. Believe. The answer is Bieber. That is correct. It has to be. Uh, uh, uh. All right. This is exciting. Last question. Anyone's game. Last question worth 10 points, I believe. Sometimes. In this case, yeah, we're going to make it 10 points. What? But it Because I could have just chilled out and, and, and won. Well, you're in the lead now. Right. <laughs> All right. So keeping in mind, keeping in mind that if you get it right, it's worth ten it's points. But if you get it it's wrong, you only lose three. This whole thing keeping is that in mind, it's all rigged. as I read the eighth and final tweet, yeah. that if you ring in and get it wrong, you only lose three points. Got it. Tweet number eight. You don't can't. judge me by my past. You can't. I don't live there anymore. David. Yes. You can't lose if I you let lose. me answer it. <laughs> no, I can't lose if. The You're the one who, if you get it right, you win. Ten points. Oh, you did. I'm the one who. You out How I obvious could I have made it? <laughs> Checkmate. So I'll guess Tyra. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. It doesn't and I win. Matter. And I win. You win the game. <laughs> and that is how you play. Suckers. Who tweeted? Sam Levine, everybody. Sam Levine. You can't outfox a fox. You cannot outfox a fox. You cannot out David Wayne, David Wayne either. <laughs> Okay. Mm. Feel better? I, I'm feeling really good. <laughs> okay. Another hour and we'll be out of here. I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready for hour number two. Um, it's been a hundred minutes. You're okay? I, listen, I'm like here to re ready to rock. I'll uh, pee later. Okay. I do want to ask about um, when we've, t we've talked about the films, we've talked about the troubleshooting, we've talked about the puzzle. When you're a, say, guest director on somebody else's baby, yes, which you do on occasion, including quite recently, The New Girl. Or as they have now been calling it, New Girl. Or just New Girl. Yeah. Um, and what is as a representative now, part of the family of New Girl, I yes. want to make sure that we do not include the article. 
the. Please. Okay. Sorry. New girl on uh, Fox Tuesday nights at nine. Whatever your TV is. It's a huge hit. Nobody, nobody needs to know from me. So when you're on somebody else's baby in television, as you well know, a writer's medium. My rights here finally. You come in as a director. Yeah. What's that like for you? Totally different thing. Uh, really fun for me because it's just such a completely different thing. I, it's, it's really just directing and trying to uh, serve the voice of the creator of the show, Liz Merriweather in this case, and the cast and the thing that's already been set up and continue a continuum but maybe just lend your own ideas and creativity to, to a certain degree to it. But for me, it's, uh, I don't think the thing I want to do is my main thing if I'm so lucky to keep doing my own thing. Right. But it was really a fun. I don't do this very often. It was a really fun experience to. Well, because as actors, we're yeah. gun for hires 90% of the time. Right. So. Uh, and when I occasionally get to be an actor, I enjoy that very much for the same reason because I'm like, I'll just do my part mm -hmm. and everyone else can worry about the whole and I don't have to. I'm so used to having to worry about everything. And it's fun to have to worry about your job. Yeah. Um, party down. Party Down was another example of a, a show that I was just a huge fan of and loved watching. And then that was such a trip for me because then to walk on set and be the director of an episode. I mean, being a director of any TV show is an odd thing because you are at once the least experienced person in that world. You're the new guy on the block and you're also in charge mm. to, in some way. Yeah. And so it's like, nice to meet you all. I don't know your names. I don't know your characters. Now I'm the, in charge. Now here's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. <laughs> and sit there and you do this in action. And so it's a very interesting dynamic, but it's... Uh, How many did it take before you got comfortable? Because that is a bizarre circumstance to be in. I can't even think of whether I've done it more than those two that you mentioned. Really? Uh, St. Elsewhere? St. Elsewhere, I did a couple of I did a few Marcus Welby's. So on The Daily Show and Strangers with Candy, were you just a writer? What were you? The Daily Show, I was on in the early Craig Kilborn era, before ah. they even knew what The Daily Show was. And I was doing fictional little, uh, you know, correspondent pieces called the Maplewood Minute, about, you know, like Hollywood Minute gossip pieces about some small town, about how somebody stole a penny from the ticket. Well, that must have been fun. It was a blast. Yeah. Uh, and then and when I was... Uh, Strangers with Candy. Strangers with Candy, I was, yeah, just a writer. It was a staff writer on that show. and um, That I, could have been your lot. You could have become absolutely. a television writer. And might have enjoyed it. And but uh, but I, I tend to enjoy, for me, I gravitate towards things I can be in charge of, however small they may be. It's just my personality. Uh, does that come from the multi-challenges only or the control aspect or the love of the puzzle, do we think? Or all I think those are all good reasons and there's probably more of them. I, just, I, like, I like the variety of dealing with different people in different ways at different parts of the process. If I was only on set or only in the edit room, I think I would be less fulfilled. That I get to go from one to the other helps my ADD a little bit. And in personal life, it's got to spill in. So between you and Zandy, who's, my wife. who's more interested in the chaos versus the control? Uh, who? What do you mean? By Are you that? both in uh, folk, uh, feel more freedom from control of your environments, or yeah, like, we're both sort of because like, I can't stand chaos; it makes me crazy. Yeah, I, I, it's we're flip sides of each other. My wife and I like my my personal space is usually pretty chaotic. Uh, you know, I leave clothes on the floor, classic male stuff, and she can't stand that. And she likes to have our house put together just so. And so, it's a classic situation like that but my you know my computer desktop is immaculate <laughs> mm -hmm. and hers is a mess oh so and i'm and workspace. i i can't stand how she doesn't you know ever you know Clean organize her apps or like figure out you know oh, all the I things see. all the things you know i i can't believe she doesn't keep her calendar set up the right way and you know how many her, files are on her desktop right well now? you know i'm also a big believer in, in an empty uh, inbox on your email um and and Sandy is not, and so it kills me. <laughs> wow. Because that's like, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a hard one, actually. Most people think, well, if I just answer it, it can stay in the inbox as... as right. Well, Merlin Mann is this writer, uh, blogger guy in San Francisco who I really, really uh, am a big fan of, and mm -hmm. he came up with a concept called Inbox Zero, which is a whole philosophy of dealing with your time and attention, uh, specifically with regards to email.
And it helps in terms of organizing your... Well, it just, you don't want to be looking at things over and over again. And there's a sense of clarity. And it's a waste of your time and brain space. And, you know, that's, I try to keep things really, especially with kids and so much work do, having to do, I try to keep things very uh, surgical. Well, I find it's helpful to go back and to be able to search for a past email that had some information. Yeah, but that's always, in, 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 on today, you can always do that. You don't have to keep it in your inbox to search it. It could just be sitting there in old mail. Yeah. Interesting. Because in this world of waking up every single damn day, 15 emails behind, it's, it's unavoidable. Well, it, it gives you this sort of sense of agita always. Yeah. And so what I do, I try to do, I'm not perfect at it, is whenever I look at my email, I just empty it. And everything either becomes, it gets thrown out or becomes a calendar item or a to-do list item. So there is no old mail is what you're saying. I'm laughing at my own wow. horrible nerdiness. You're, you're admitting quite a lot yeah. on the show here. No, the, but the old mail just goes archived. Everything's archived, so I can search. I have millions of emails from dating back to 10 years that I can search anytime. Right. Uh, you mentioned before the show you two were on the uh, 84 tower on the Mac. The Mac teat since the well, original. Not a, yeah, well, not the tower, the original Mac, which was the little portable thing. For, that was, it was introduced January 24th, 1984, and um, Jesus. The, the 2G? <laughs> Such a nerd. No, the original Mac 256K. Oh, okay. um, 256K. Let's be clear. Come on, guys, please. What are we talking about? Get our did, story did, straight. Did seeing that commercial directed by Ridley Scott, did that change you? Yes. <laughs> that's all he's going to give you, Sammy. One word. That's a um, real, that's a, that's a, no, that's a serious commercial. No, I actually didn't get, I didn't have my own until the Mac Plus came along of some months later. I had, but I had a friend who had a Mac right then, in the beginning. Right. And are you, uh, all caught up in terms of filmmaking and the tools that are ready and waiting for you on the Mac as well? Or are you, yeah. uh, you shot on 35, you mentioned on, uh, uh, beforehand on Wonderlust, so you're cutting on? We cut this one on the Avid, mm -hmm. um, but I do uh, have been a very loyal to the Final Cut Pro over the years uh, up until, you know, I, I try, I'm getting to the point where I'm trying to know as much as I can about all these things so I don't have to feel like I only do it one way or the other. So I'm, I'm learning the new Final Cut Pro, which has nothing to do with the old one. And your audience is now asleep. Oh, no. <laughs> no, there's people that are into this stuff because they're, yeah. they're getting educational tools as well. Robert Legato, the Academy Award winner, visual effects genius from uh, the Hugo. Uh, who sat here for a wonderful interview. Oh, I would uh, like. Talked about these very things. Can we find this interview on your website? If you were to go to KevinPollocksChowcher.com, it's in the archives. And what about if we it's go to It's also on the Hulu. Yeah. It's okay. on the Hulu.com or, the, or uh, the iTunes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, uh, uh, my directorial debut, please. Uh, no, I won't. Uh, vamped out. Um, look for it on, on uh, KevinPollock.tv. He uh, was my, uh, my DP and my, my cutter as well. Very good. My shooter and my cutter, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, with the worst lighting package in maybe history because it didn't exist. Uh, but when he cut on the Avid, uh, it was the first time I got to actually sort of be near the helm and in that uh, world as we watched the... Um, the various scenes take shape. The Avid is the editing software that used to make m m movies. Right. And um, our assistant editor, our very own Josh Negrin, was the Final Cut Pro guy. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of, I heard a lot of uh, friction between these worlds. So the fact that you wanted to conquer both. Well, I, I was up until recently very much like, I hate the Avid, I love Final Cut Pro. Right. And I almost, I'm still kind of that way, but the new Final Cut Pro is such a uh, wild card, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. They've changed it entirely from scratch. Yeah, that's not a Mac thing at all. It is a Mac thing, but it, uh, yeah. Look, Apple's not perfect. Far from it. In fact, some would say it's the devil's play from day one. Mm -hmm. Listen, I see. You know, Nobody on this show. Chinese factory. Um, all right. I want you to start thinking in terms of your Larry King game. Just to start ger ger germing it uh, in there. I'm germing uh, it. Are you, are you, in fact, uh, 
you can't say much more about um, the prequel or the sequel, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push because Michael it, Showalter and I are writing the script, and what else can I say? You're working on a couple things. You and Ken are still working on things. We're yeah, we're writing a couple uh, things, and we're also preparing this new spinoff to Children's Hospital called Newsreaders, which we're gonna start shooting in the spring, and it's gonna be on after that sometime. Uh, yeah. How's that part in that? That's the we'll nice talk. part. We'll nice talk. part. You don't need a part in that. You're a feature film guy. How insanely yeah. funny is Sammy I, Levine? I, I, how, yeah, we'll talk. How insanely funny is Kenny Marino? Ken Marino is one of the funniest men on the planet. You guys first started working back in the day we were talking about. Uh, we were roommates at NYU. There was a third guy also. Gene Hackman. Well, we, we, lived, my, uh, we lived five of us uh, in a room, uh, me and Ken and two or three. I forget if it was. We all lived in, together in different ways, all the state people right. over time. And... Uh, he, he uh, first of all, his work on Children's Hospital is crazy, amazing, fantastic, and funny. He's so funny. If you, if you see Children's Hospital, then you watch Party Down, then you watch Wanderlust. His work in Wanderlust. Yeah. Oh, my God. Because he plays a despicable, wildly unlikable character who you instantly love because of the actor doing the work. He's really good. He has a moment of frustration where he chooses to do this <laughs> motion. I won't do it a disjustice. Or a misjustice. I had to keep talking him into leaving in certain things that were so genius like that because he got it's, self-conscious. It's or? too much, you know. And I'm like, that's the point. It's so good because it's too much. Yeah. yeah. His character in Wanderlust is completely and utterly out of his mind. Yeah. In a magical way. Yeah, I would love to do, uh, you know, more with uh, that character. I'd like to take the her, him and, and Michaela Watkins, the genius Michaela Watkins, plays his wife in right. the film. And I would love to do a whole movie about that couple. They need to have a, some some kind of spinning off. Maybe a web series. Maybe a who knows. Maybe it's a pilot. Maybe a who knows. Could be a novel. <laughs> no, I would mm -hmm. I would suggest you go a different way. All right. Uh, use a visual medium. Okay. But only because Ken, uh, as you've established, uh, thinks of comedy in a visual way. Think visual. It is an organic thing that you referred to that he has. It's yeah. something that comes instinctively or it doesn't. Well, clearly. I mean, you know, when you're as talented as someone like Ken, yeah, it's not, I mean, you know, none of, none of this stuff is, you have to be born with some of it. Well, I guess what I'm saying is you can intellectualize it. You can see it on the paper. You can envision uh, even the portrayal of it, but to just in the designing moments yeah. of the funny. Uh, to see, as you were saying, maybe where the camera should be, and right. and the and the and what player the camera should be on when this moment hits. Those visual senses. There's no like textbook answer to a lot of these things. It's crazy talent just to have. Just yeah, trying to figure out from you know, call on your instinct and and a huge part of all this stuff. And you probably know this as an actor. It's just to let let go of your blocks. You know, like let your instinct have a voice as opposed to quelling it. Yeah. That's like a, one of the biggest things to do. When you, let's talk about that. When you are dealing with an actor who, for whatever reason, because there are countless, and I don't want to point fingers, for whatever reason, actor is, um, is not there, is not getting it, is, yeah. not, is not in the groove mm -hmm. that you have in mind, especially when you're talking about comedy and the delicate nature of it. Even in the hands of the best, sometimes they're just not, mm -hmm. I just not get it. Happens all the time. Uh, where do you go? How do you communicate at that point? Because let's say you've already tried now. Now we're on take 11. Uh, well, sometimes you have to, you think about changing something in the script. Maybe, it, you know, you, you never really can tell. Maybe it is the script's fault. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's, you sometimes trying to change something up and maybe that it unlocks something. Maybe there's some new note you can give them or some what, new way to tell, tell them about what you think the scene is or, New little magic key that you can, you know, think of it this way, or you know. But uh, if it's getting to that point where it's just not working, you, you maybe you just move on, <laughs> uh, and then think about how you're going to accommodate that as you finish shooting the other parts. So make less of a big deal out of it. Yeah. Um, how easy did you take to the communicating with actors? Because the communicating what you want, uh, I assume, is a little different with each player. Because Absolutely, they can uh, embrace it differently. Everybody has different needs, for sure. But I would say one of the things I learned from talking to actors over the years and and doing it myself a little bit is 
more than half, I would say, will mostly want to be left alone uh, at points. Like right. the, the, their biggest complaints about directors are when they're like when they're like overly trying to explain stuff. When they're like, just let me do my thing at least first. You right. know. So I've learned to try to navigate that, and that's also just instinct. But um, it's tricky ground. But by you know, I think any director should try to to be to do acting and you know take a swing at it so that they understand what actors are going through. Because if you don't, then then you how could you possibly tell them what to do or talk to them about it? You want to make the sandbox a fun place to play and everyone to feel vulnerable and valued. And valued, yeah, that's huge. Because well, I mean, we're just children in that sandbox, and we need to hear that everything's okay. Well, and also that you were brought into the sandbox because you, you're you good, and you and we want you here. Just leave the shovel when you're done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I feel like, I feel like if I was watching this show, I'd be like, that guy is an ass. <laughs> well, it's important that you be self-critical. Yeah. Uh, I can be self-critical. Yeah. I sense that. I mean, for example, not every movie I've made has been a huge hit. I can't think of an example, but. <laughs> well, huge hit is in the hands of others. Huge hit. Right. Uh, the reviewers of Wanderlust, while uh, every, the, mo every movie has a, a scale, a sliding scale. The majority of the reviews majority have been very fantastic, good. right? Yeah, but I there's mean, some really beautiful reviews. For example, I don't want to point fingers and name names, but there's someone who writes for the Bible, Entertainment Weekly, mm -hmm. who has the reputation of being very hard. Yeah. Gave it an A minus, which is a glowing. Bomb. Lisa Schwartzbaum. Yeah, no, that was incredible, and and also uh, the New Yorker gave a great review. The Times gave a decent review, and some of the big places. Cat uh, Fancy. Yep, Cat Loved Cat it. Fancy. Um, nude Skydiver. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, the reviews have been really cool, you know, but, uh, but a lot of the things that the medium or negative reviews have said uh, have been interesting to me. And, you know, they're, it's not a perfect film by, by a long shot. So it's been interesting to hear all sides of it. So you like to read all of them, good and the bad, and take what, what you can. Yeah. Well, see, I that. don't obsessively read them all at all. Because they, they so often say the same things over and over again. And, and in the age of the Internet, there's thousands of reviews. Right. So I couldn't possibly. But, uh, you know, I do find that whether I agree with it or not, it's always interesting to hear what people think. Mm. That's an amazing place to get to, by the way. Did you always have that, where you were curious? Kind of. Well, when The State first came out, the reviews were so scathing and so hostile and so negative, just like this was the worst show ever, like it's horrible, it's horrific, it's painful. Well, that's not helpful, though. Well, it wasn't helpful, but it was so... I mean, it's not constructive. But it was like walking through the... Like, we, it'll never get worse than that. And so, even though everything I've done has gotten similar types of reviews, at least in part, when Stella came on and, and Wet Hot American Summer, like, just, like, I think sometimes what I do, the kind of comedy that I do, doesn't fit enough into a category that certain reviewers become hostile because they can't figure it out and they want it and they get angry yeah. at me personally. Yeah. yeah, of course. And I'm like, sorry, I thought it was funny. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you didn't necessarily make it for them, might be. Um... Yeah, I didn't, yeah. But, you know, we, we've uh, always joked about when we were doing the Stella show on Comedy Central, which I understand now is pretty obscure in certain ways, but we didn't think of it that way. We right. just thought of it as, this is just funny. Like, and that's just, I, clearly my sensibility isn't exactly mainstream. <laughs> but, yeah, but thankfully, and your fans don't want it to be, and that's why they've gathered. Right. Because it isn't mainstream. And then the hope is just that there will be enough of them over time that I can feed my family. Sex, a.k.a. Wieners and Boobs. This yes. was a st stage play that you did with uh, Joe and... Michael Showalter. Michael Showalter. Fantastic name. Um, is there any chance we'll see you? Yeah, uh, we've, we've, it's a fun play. And, and there, it's actually published by this place, playscripts.com. Mm -hmm. So other people have done productions of it from time to time over the years. In fact, every year there's one or two somewhere. And, uh, but, I mean, it's a little funny, stupid little play, but we, um, we might bring the original cast back together again sometime and do it. It's fun. Hello, Sketchfest. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah, right? Yeah. We have talked about that. Aisle 6. My this is your film. short film that wins awards and gets you to the Sundance Film Festival for the first time? Uh, yes, exactly right. 
Aisle 6 uh, was my 20-minute student film. It's actually available to be watched on the Wainy Days DVD, which was recently released, and is available at wainydays.com. The state DVD finally came out in 09, much uh -huh. ballet hued. Yes. And now you're saying the Wainy Days DVD, the latest season? It's, the, it's the, all of the first four seasons, plus a ton of extras available nowhere else. Nowhere else? Many of which were produced specifically for this DVD. Well, that's damn exciting. When does that drop? It's dropped. It's out. What are you waiting for? You can pause this stream right now. If you must. Go to Amazon, type in Wainy Days, and you'll have it in tomorrow. For fuck's sake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, aisle six, this was a, a student, uh, your uh, thesis, you're graduating? What, exactly. How exciting that it, that thesis gets you to Sundance. I mean, that's kind of every young filmmaker's... It was so exciting for me. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, it was, you know, Sundance was, everything was different then. But, sure. But uh, I, you know, worked for 14 months making this 20-minute film, and I submitted to Sundance, and they rejected it. And the guy, though, was so nice, this guy named John Cooper, who I've subsequently stayed in touch with over the years, and he said, you know what, I really like this. We just didn't have room for it or whatever, and I thought he was bullshitting. He said, try again next year. And I did, and it got in the next year. Submit again next year, he said. Yeah, because I, I turned it in right when I finished it. And then so, anyway, so I went the next year. That was Sundance in 93, January of 93, and I went there by myself. I didn't know anyone in any part of any of the industry. I slept in this hotel they had there, which was barracks. And it was like 20 guys, most of whom were short filmmakers, uh, sleeping like in, in army barracks mm -hmm. uh, in one room. And the light was on all night because people had to come and go. And it was like ridiculous, $20 a night. And I met people there that I still am in touch with. And you know, it was nuts. A film youth hostel. Yeah. But, I, but now Park City is so fancy that even that's not an, even an option anymore. Right. Uh, you've been back since? I went back with Wet Hot American Summer. Wet Hot. With the 10. Debuted there. And then I had a, I've been there so with two other films, but then I had a great experience of being invited by Microsoft to, this is, this is kind of funny. I went with, I, Microsoft had a, you know, at Sundance Film Festival they have all these like pavilions and, you know, corporations take over a storefront to like hawk their wares yes. to, to celebrities and so forth. So their thing, Microsoft opened the Microsoft House yes. because their big thing was HD DVD, which was the com competition to Blu-ray. And this was at the time when it was people were like, is it going to be HD DVD or is it going to be Blu-ray? But by the time Sundance actually started, it was over. The right? decision from, had been made. The, the America's it's like I think they had you know the studios had gone with Blu-ray and the HD DVD was done. The writing was on the wall. It was over. But it was too late to cancel this whole House. thing. So I went there, and it was the most delusional in denial situation. And I was literally, you know, I'm David Wayne, and like, HD DVD is so great, and here's how it works, and here's a demonstration. And my film, The Ten, uh, was the, one of the first and only now <laughs> HD DVDs. And it was so funny, because we all knew, like, we're like, they're like, well, there's still a 1% chance that things will change somehow. And <laughs> yeah, you can also get this movie on Betamax. And, you know, I think that with the way Microsoft accounting works, it was easier to not cancel it. And so we all got paid and there was fancy stuff and, you know, <laughs> it was so funny. Anyway. Oh, my God. And so I have a whole stack of HD DVDs. Do you? And a player. Can't give them away. It works. Yeah. I can still turn it in. <laughs> Come over and see. Yeah. And then we'll watch Some the movies that came out in 2007. Oh, God. <laughs> That's pretty fantastic, though. Those moments yeah. in time, come on. Yeah. Um, come on. All right, gearing, gearing up the Larry King, sir. Right now? Feeling it. I want you to start <sighs> putting it together. Yeah. You've made the two-hour mark. We're proud of you. I look, you know, I do my thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like meaningless shit that you say when you have nothing to say. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I uh, Really, I'm extremely grateful that, that uh, you made time for us, honestly and truly. I'm so flattered. I can't believe it. I mean, oh. Alison Brie was here, for oh. example. Then there's that. Did you get her on this past season of Children's? We didn't, but I don't oh. think we did, but we really tried. We're big mutual fans, I think. And yeah, it was, uh, I, I was watching Twitter the day that happened. I tried to get her on into role models, in fact. <gasps> it was a long story. And now she's got the community and the Mad Men coming back. Oh, yeah. A, She's unstoppable. Within weeks. She's an unstoppable It's going to be all about the Allison. I can't wait for Mad Men. That's the one show I watch. No. Three weeks from tonight? I don't know. Three it's weeks from tonight. 25th, I have right? to rewatch the whole series. 
No, you don't. No, you can't in three weeks. How I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You can. It can be done. It can be done. I want to add another baton. Let's start now. I watched, when I discovered West Wing, it was during the sixth season, and I watched the entire series in like two weeks. <laughs> yeah. But I was unemployed and single. It helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I recently had the all first three, only three seasons of Deadwood happen the same thing mm. uh, in a sick bed over 48 hours. Um, that is your camera. Mm. Again, I'll go over the rules. I want a bad Larry King. I want that Larry sharing too much information about himself. And then go to the phones, and if the name of the city is funny sounding, it's helpful. Oh, God. <clears throat> when you're ready, sir. Okay, here we go. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> By the way, if you're ever on the West Coast, I urge you to go see Dr. Berger. He will give you a colonoscopy that does more than just clean out your colon in a terrific way. He will wipe the blackheads off your pubic mound in a way that I have never been able to do in 20 years of wiping with creams. Okay, Chagrin Falls, Ohio. Do we have a question for Sherry Lewis and Lamcha? <laughs> Chagrin Falls. Thank you, sir. I loved it. Yes. You're a good man. Thank you so very, very much. And I'm genuinely a fan. Uh, uh, that yes. Makes, that, 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 I'm, uh, I'm my own wet hot American. Oh. What? When summer. Uh, sit I'm, there. And me too, because I'm about to pee in my pants. Yes, I know. That's why you only sit there uncomfortably for another 30 seconds while I wrap things up. Yeah, no, Say goodbye to I'm the folks at home and that. around the world. Thank yeah. you so much for tuning in. Um, next week's show is uh, up in the air as we had Drew Carey uh, demanding to reschedule that son of a bitch. Um, uh, so we'll keep you posted. Watch on the Twitter feed at Kevin Pollock for updates on that. Um, Tuesday, March 6, Columbus Circle, a movie starring Sam Levine, or should I say featuring? Featuring, featuring Sam, Sam Levine, Levine. Starring and written by Kevin Pollack. Uh, Antoon. Jason Antoon, uh, of course, not to mention Antoon. Giovanni Ribisi, Selma Blair, Jason Lee, Amy Smart, um, Bo, Bridges. Bo Bridges. What? It's a little Hitchcock uh, kind of thriller. Yeah. That I, sign me up. I wrote no. with um, George Gallo, the film's director. Fabulous. Uh, Columbus Circle, it's called. It drops on your Blu-ray, March 6. Does it take place in Columbus Circle? Yes, it does. Oh, forget yeah. it, I'm there. You're in. Um... And Talk and Walkin', check it out. Let me know what you think. Talkandwalkin.com is where you'll find it, as well as iTunes. I want to thank uh, Adam, we mentioned, our, our wonderful intern. Elaine Ewing, our social media expert who asks uh, ridiculous, non-helpful questions during uh, the show. Uh, the fabulous Dr. Chen, who's still recovering from a leap year at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. Jamie and Sam, thank you. E. Josh Negrin. We've got the Justin Weiss out there, and of course the J-Mac. And uh, Heather. Kind enough from uh, Children's Hospital crew to do uh, makeup for us. It was unbelievably helpful. She's the best. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about Children's Hospital. The new season begins... Sometime in June, maybe? Something I'm going like to say June, maybe. And for God's sake, go to your computer and buy a ticket online for Wanderlust and go see it in the theater. Please do yourselves a favor. See Wanderlust in the motion picture theater where it was meant to be seen as well as the Bizarro version when it comes out on the DVD sometime over the summer, maybe, I'm thinking, look for it then, but go see it in the theater. You will thank us. In fact, write to us at contact com. If you hated the film and you can explain why, I might send you $9. No. That's ridiculous. No. But I do really want to encourage you to go see it because it's super fantastic, and, and it's so rare to ha see a movie that as a person who's been trying to make funny my entire life, I laugh myself to tears in the theater. It just doesn't happen, but it did. Uh, the scene with Paul Rudd in the mirror mm -hmm. may go down in the annals for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get a chance to ask our guest, but f first day of shooting is the scene with Paul Rudd on the that toilet. That was not the first day. On the toilet okay. and in the mirror, both in the first day. Come on. I had that in my notes. We never got to it. Damn. Ludicrous. I'll have to bring Ken Marino in here to talk to him. I think about Joe it. told you about that a little bit, though, right? Yeah, he did a little bit, yeah. That's how I found out those two things were in the first day. All right, uh, check the, uh, the chat show schedule to find out upcoming shows. We've got um, on, the, on the 18th, Ed Begley Jr. We've got uh, Jason Biggs coming up, some great ones coming up. Uh, so look for that, and um, sure love to hear from you. So please write to us as many times and as often as you can. Uh, that is it for today. I'm sure there's someone I've forgotten. I apologize to them. Jesus Christ. Uh, and until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>